already start because it's 9.30. I'm the I'm leading, I'm the chair of the session today. Um, so I would like to ask everybody, I see you already muted yourselves, but uh, just keep yourselves muted, um, um, except if you are invited to talk specifically. And if you have any, for those who are actually listening, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. And we will follow the chat and um, um, ask the presenters these questions. And the presenters, keep yourself muted, uh, please, uh, until the moment in which you actually uh, give a presentation. Uh, if you have some questions, type them into the chat. We will follow them. Uh, and also to say that, uh, actually, we also follow the chat in uh, YouTube. So in case uh, somebody cannot access uh, uh, the press, this uh, program, we will, the WebEx program we will actually uh, also follow the chat and see if, if there are any questions there to the presenters. So let me just check if I can start. Um, another thing uh, to those who are presenting, um, can you actually um, write to the host uh, privately and also to me so I know who you are and uh, who is presenting today besides the invited speaker who is, uh, whom I know and is well known. And um, I would also want to say that uh, I will actually write in the chat how many minutes uh, you have left for the presenters. Uh, starting from 10 minutes, then 5 minutes, 2 minutes, 1 minute, and uh, so follow the chat from time to time to see what, what how many minutes are left for your presentation.
Okay, uh, let's start. Um, so I'm starting uh, the today session of the clip conference um, with uh, the invited speaker today. Uh, let me say just a few words of the invited speaker about the invited speaker. Um, so um, uh, the, the invited speaker of the morning of this morning is the associate professor Svetla Bojcheva. Uh, besides being my university lecturer, uh, she has a very long experience in machine learning, natural language processing, and uh, bioinformatics. And she has participated in a long list of uh, um, EU-funded and national-funded uh, national research projects, including on bioinformatics. Uh, she's currently participating, for example, in Examode, uh, which is a research project uh, on which she's working uh, um, the company onto text, uh, it's trading as, as onto text, and uh, um, so at Wabojewa is actually the senior research lead in this uh, very well known um, company. It's called uh, the, the company is, uh, is known by the name currently as Sirma AI, trading as onto text, as I said. So please, Svetla, start your presentation. So just just to mention that uh, Svet will talk about the clip can you clip. see my screen? Yes, we see it. So I'm muting myself and you will continue. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I can. Okay. okay. Um, thank yes. you. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to present uh, this talk um, at this conference and uh, thank you to Irina Tamnikova for a uh, nice presentation and uh, I, I'm going to present today clinical natural language processing in Bulgaria and uh, um, the Talk is organized as follows. Uh, first, uh, I will discuss briefly uh, the clinical documents um, in Bulgarian, uh, some resources uh, which um, we used uh, for processing those documents, uh, some computational methods uh, experiment. Um, the medical uh, uh, domain is a data-intensive domain and due to the recent uh, penetration of the information and communication technology, data that are produced by healthcare sector, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the, the biomedical research, uh, like research publications, uh, are uh, accelerating uh, um, every day. The um, information for the patients uh, mainly is available like free text in uh, electronic health record systems uh, uh, or even it's uh, organized uh, somehow in um, semi-structured format in electronic health records, uh, huge pieces uh, of uh, information is uh, uh, still stored as uh, clinical narratives. And uh, the task related uh, to um, uh, processing uh, clinical uh, documents uh, can be um, uh, considered as uh, um, information extraction uh, tasks uh, or tax mining tasks, uh, which uh, require uh, extraction of uh, uh, information uh, from uh, discharge letters or outpatient records or from electronic health records uh, like diagnosis, um, different symptoms, uh, treatment uh, information, risk factors or related events uh, to uh, the environment uh, uh, and uh, the habits of the patients. Um, the other task which is uh, quite uh, important is uh, um, related to data normalization. 
data normalization actually requires uh, those extracted pieces of information to be mapped to uh, standard uh, um, uh, taxonomies, uh, classifications, ontologies, and etc. in order to have uh, uh, disambiguation of all this information and uh, to be able further to process it uh, uh, and uh, to make different uh, inferences, um, different uh, patterns to be found, uh, and uh, to find uh, uh, very complex uh, causality relations. And uh, the fourth group of tasks uh, are actually related to already structured information, which we uh, uh, actually uh, extract uh, from the first task from tax mining, and then normalize uh, and uh, map uh, to different ontologies and classification schemes. And uh, the data mining uh, actually tries uh, to identify uh, interrelations uh, between symptoms, uh, risk factors, uh, and uh, uh, different um, uh, disease relations so like comorbidities uh, uh, to predict uh, uh, different uh, events. Uh, and uh, this is really important for prevention and treatment of diseases. Uh, the discharge level in Bulgaria are um, usually short narratives. They are pretext, um, usually two, three pages, uh, and uh, they have very, very uh, um, specific structure, which is according to the national law, uh, and uh, there are uh, predefined uh, sections, uh, uh, the following sections, diagnosis, uh, case history, it's also called anamnesis, um, uh, 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 short review of past diseases which are related to, to the uh, current case, uh, origins and uh, other risk factors, uh, family and medical history, um, description of the patient status, the clinical tests, uh, lab data which uh, uh, were made uh, either before the hospitalization or during the hospital stay. Uh, medical examiner's uh, comments uh, and uh, when the patient is uh, discharged, there is a short debate and uh, prescription for uh, treatment. This structure is mandatory, which means uh, we have a, a, a very uh, uh, well-defined uh, uh, structure, but uh, still in some uh, discharge letters, some of those uh, sections are missing uh, here as presented uh, for a sh small excerpt of uh, discharge letters, uh, about uh, 6,000 uh, discharge letters, uh, statistics, the presence of different uh, uh, sections. And uh, anyway, even uh, some uh, sections are missing, uh, the, the context can be uh, really well identified and the context information structure is uh, quite uh, uh, with quite a good uh, uh, precision. Uh, the patient records are other uh, um, uh, clinical narratives, uh, which uh, are again with uh, some structured sections, uh, but uh, they have uh, several huge sections with uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, pretext, which uh, actually allows uh, us uh, to extract uh, from here uh, very uh, important information. The XML format of a patient record uh, actually has structured only the um, administrative information, which is important for reimbursement, but the uh, information for the current uh, patient uh, status uh, compliance is in free text. And here as an example for uh, the free text in uh, anamnesis in uh, our patient records, uh, which uh, starts with patient history, with patient status, um, different um, uh, examines and uh, prescribed uh, therapy. 
the medical uh, terminology which is used The, in this document, is mixture of between the Latin and Latin. Here in this example, you can see we have uh, 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 Latin uh, uh, in Latin, and here in the uh, last row, you can see we have uh, Latin terms uh, which are transcribed uh, with Cyrillic letters, and we have also um, uh, corresponding uh, medical terminology in Bulgarian. And uh, those uh, uh, terminologies uh, are mixed in uh, different uh, combinations. Um, it depends um, on the uh, medical uh, uh, doctor, which uh, uh, type of uh, terminology uh, will use, uh, and usually are used uh, different combinations. This one requires uh, not only to, to try to process uh, the medical text um, in Bulgarian, but also to, to start uh, processing the Latin uh, medical um, terminology, which is used uh, in those documents. Um, we have a um, um, really uh, challenging task because uh, the, the Latin terminology is uh, actually a combination between different roots and suffix suffixes in Latin and Greek. And uh, if uh, we try to, to make a parallel between the um, transliteration and uh, the uh, original term, there are a huge number of rules uh, for transliteration. Uh, one rules are applied for um, terminology uh, with uh, uh, Greek, uh, uh, which uh, is based on the Greek uh, terms, and uh, another transliteration for Latin terms. But there are also uh, hybrid uh, uh, terms which uh, use roots, prefixes, and suffixes in both Greek and Latin, uh, like on the next slide, like mammogram, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular, and etc., which requires uh, each part of the term to be transliterated depending on um, the um, uh, on that what. It it's based on Latin or Greek. And also, we faced a lot of problems with transliteration and parallel between Latin and transliterated in Cyrillic Latin, because there are no resources for such terminology in transliterated Latin. And uh, when we start transliterated uh, Latin terms, uh, they are, are also included uh, non-Latin and non-Greek uh, um, uh, words. Uh, for instance, for some syndromes are used uh, different names uh, of uh, uh, persons which should be transliterated depending uh, on uh, uh, their uh, origins. And uh, also a lot of uh, additional symbols are used, uh, for instance, in the diseases like uh, different uh, uh, letters in Roman and etc., which can't be transliterated, which uh, requires uh, development of very sophisticated uh, transliteration tool for medical terminology. For nomenclatures, uh, which are used uh, uh, to assign and to normalize data, um, are used uh, several um, uh, international nomenclatures, which are used uh, 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 from Bulgarian uh, uh, Ministry of Health, and they are approved and applied uh, in all uh, the uh, 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 hospitals and uh, all uh, clinics uh, when uh, such documents are developed, uh, such are the disease-related ontologies, uh, uh, anatomic, uh, therapeutic, uh, chemical classification, which is used uh, 
for uh, drugs and medicine, lo logical observation, identification, identifiers, names and codes, which is used uh, for uh, clinical and lab results. Uh, for procedures is used uh, Australian classification and health uh, interventions. Um, the codes uh, for ICD-10 um, clinical modification, uh, they can be three symbols or uh, four symbols or uh, many other expansions can be used, but in Bulgaria they are used up to four symbols. And uh, terminologic anatomica, actually terminology anatomica is a very classic document uh, for different um, uh, anatomical organs and uh, uh, systems um, in Latin. This is another source which we use as a basis uh, for development of resources. Unfortunately, this document is uh, very ancient and uh, only scanned and uh, really bad quality uh, versions uh, are available. But uh, I will discuss uh, later uh, how we managed uh, to, to get this information. Um, and uh, the major obstacle um, in processing uh, clinical texts is uh, that there is used a broken medical language. A lot of concatenated words, because usually physicians are um, uh, short in time and uh, they are in hurry uh, to produce this documentation. Um, missing punctuation, just telegraphic style without uh, full stops or uh, commas or any other punctuation. A lot of typos, um, a lot of transliterations uh, which are freely transliterated, not uh, according to the rules. A lot of homoglyphs uh, because uh, um, usually um, uh, physicians are tend not to, to shift between Cyrillic and Latin and they can uh, type uh, uh, the same uh, symbols, uh, for instance, O in Latin or in Cyrillic, uh, for, for them it's, uh, it doesn't matter because uh, it seems uh, uh, equivalent. Um, here is an example for uh, one uh, diagnosis. This is for one patient from one patient record. You can see here more than 40 diagnoses are listed and uh, you can imagine uh, how this uh, can be normalized and mapped to different uh, uh, classifications and ontologies uh, 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 because uh, here are used also a lot of um, uh, abbreviations and uh, uh, also there are some typos and uh, also a lot of uh, transliterated Latin terms, etc. And uh, during the uh, so we developed uh, for different projects uh, a lot of uh, tools uh, uh, to deal with uh, different uh, types of uh, information which uh, uh, can be extracted. Uh, initially, we started uh, the link with uh, very specific uh, uh, types. Uh, 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 terms and types of tasks. Uh, here is presented uh, the task uh, for uh, extraction of the current treatment of the patient because when the patient is um, uh, actually uh, hospitalized, uh, 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 the patient actually uh, brings uh, a lot of uh, documents and uh, already uh, some uh, uh, drugs are prescribed before hospitalization and uh, when uh, the patient is uh, actually hospitalized, uh, the hospital information system uh, should be able somehow to identify the previous treatment and to combine or to change some of this previous treatment with the current treatment during hospitalization. This is a very important task um, and uh, because uh, this information is available only in the clinical uh, documents uh, uh, produced uh, by the general practitioner in uh, free text, uh, we need to be able uh, to identify medications. For this one, we used a huge list of uh, 
current medications uh, which uh, are uh, allowed uh, to be um, uh, actually um, trade in the Bulgarian um, uh, pharmacies. Uh, this list uh, usually changes uh, every two weeks because uh, some medications, uh, some new medications uh, are actually uh, added to lists and some medications uh, are deleted. And uh, this uh, requires a uh, frequent uh, update of uh, the list of medications. Uh, we produced uh, a lot of rules, approximately 150 rules, and uh, we use a rule based uh, approach uh, to identify medication, the current dosage frequency, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Dosage and frequency uh, can be uh, actually combined in different ways, uh, and uh, they, they can be also uh, represented uh, with uh, different uh, 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 different patterns. The, the most uh, uh, difficult task uh, was uh, to identify the scope uh, of uh, medication dosage frequency presence. Um, and these narratives, uh, which dosage frequency to which medication wrappers. And uh, we used, uh, I already mentioned, uh, a lot of rules. Um, this uh, uh, experiments uh, were performed uh, uh, for uh, about uh, 6,000 discharge letters uh, for very specific um, uh, type of diseases uh, for endocrine and uh, metabolic uh, disorders, uh, which uh, actually means we have very uh, uh, specific rules uh, regarding um, the, the patient records. And uh, um, the uh, recall was really high, approximately 86%. Uh, and the precision was uh, also high, approximately 92%. Um, There's uh, um, uh, tools uh, which uh, were uh, developed uh, during the project uh, uh, were integrated with hospital information system. And here you can see when the patient is hospitalized, uh, here is uh, actually mentioned uh, the treatment uh, when the patient uh, is uh, hospitalized and the system uh, is uh, automatically connected with the hospital pharmacy. It reports uh, the identified uh, uh, medications and their treatment and sends the message to the hospital pharmacy to check uh, whether these uh, uh, drugs and medications are available. And uh, also, the uh, doctors are able to, to uh, change uh, this uh, treatment or uh, just uh, to continue the duration of the treatment and combine this treatment with new ones. Uh, the other source which we used uh, was uh, the Bulgarian uh, 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 diabetes register. This register is uh, developed uh, uh, automatically. It's generated automatically uh, from um, uh, the uh, outpatient records, which are produced by uh, uh, general practitioners and specialists uh, in uh, uh, clinics, uh, and uh, they are signed uh, to the uh, National Health Insurance Fund uh, in. Uh, XML format, uh, but still with uh, huge pieces of uh, pretext. And from those uh, uh, outpatient records uh, are uh, extracted some significant uh, um, parts uh, related uh, to the uh, uh, lab results, to some clinical treatment, uh, uh, some uh, symptoms, diseases, etc and is uh, produced uh, uh, some structured format, which allows uh, to, to process this information further for uh, different um, patterns and uh, to, to uh, search for risk factors. 
Uh, this is a population uh, based uh, register for uh, all uh, Bulgarian citizens, uh, which uh, are actually uh, uh, actually uh, who have uh, uh, health insurance uh, and contains for more than 5.5 million people um, all their visits uh, to uh, general practitioners and specialists uh, for about 10 years. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, was uh, a huge resource, and uh, this uh, resource actually needs uh, further investigation. When we started working with uh, this uh, huge number of outpatient records, actually, uh, we uh, uh, faced uh, the limitations of our previous uh, solutions uh, because uh, here, we have uh, the national uh, uh, resources uh, and uh, this uh, resources actually contain very um, uh, different vocabulary from those uh, which uh, we processed earlier because they were based on uh, uh, only one hospital and here uh, in different regions of Bulgaria are used uh, uh, different um, uh, vocabularies, different types of narrative, and etc. And uh, we saw here actually the problem uh, um, because uh, there are no resources uh, that uh, are available for processing uh, medical uh, uh, terminology in Bulgaria, and uh, and uh, we needed uh, to develop such resources. Um, the first task which uh, we uh, solved was uh, the extraction of uh, blood pressure expressions. Uh, here presented uh, the small um, uh, pace of uh, presentations. Uh, the presentations are several hundreds different presentations we identified uh, in the resource. Uh, and. Uh, Actually, uh, we developed um, a very complicated um, classification for uh, different um, uh, clinical uh, numerical data which are presented um, in the documents. And uh, we developed um, uh, uh, different uh, algorithms uh, for extracting uh, uh, those uh, numerical uh, clinical data and to assigning uh, them uh, to the corresponding um, uh, factors like blood pressure, like uh, glucose, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, frequency, etc. Um, this uh, was uh, applied uh, uh, for the whole uh, diabetes register and uh, actually produced uh, really uh, high accuracy results. But this was uh, a long way um, before uh, actually achieving such results. And we faced uh, actually the problem that um, also some of those um, uh, numericals uh, uh, are uh, somehow nested and uh, we, we should be able to identify the, the scope in which they are presented and which one to, to which um, uh, uh, actually uh, type refers. And um, besides uh, the huge variety of their representations uh, for, for each um, um, observation, uh, for instance, here for height, we have also several hundreds of representations of the uh, the phrase uh, which uh, denotes uh, the, the current height of the patient, several hundreds for um, this Riberoche is the method for uh, blood pressure measuring and uh, etc. For each of them, we faced uh, a, a huge number of varieties and uh, we developed uh, 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 this um, uh, taxonomy for uh, different types of uh, numericals and uh, also uh, context-free grammar. And we used, uh, based on this uh, context-free grammar, uh, 
different regular expressions uh, to uh, extract the, those observations. And our later task was uh, to identify uh, different findings um, in the uh, uh, texts uh, when we uh, uh, apply tax mining techniques uh, to identify, for instance, uh, previous diseases, some uh, symptoms, etc. We need to be able uh, to normalize uh, those findings uh, to standard ontologies, classifications, and nomenclatures uh, in order, in order uh, later uh, to process uh, those findings. But uh, also for this task, uh, we didn't have uh, resources uh, like uh, the list of all possible uh, diseases. We have only the classification of diseases, but diseases uh, by itself, uh, which are listed by uh, 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 medical professionals, uh, are quite different uh, from uh, the classification um, uh, uh, terms which are used. That's why our first task was uh, to, to try to map uh, any diagnosis uh, written in any format with different paraphrases, uh, even with different uh, uh, words uh, which uh, have nothing to do with uh, the, the classification terms uh, to the uh, specific codes uh, for the international classification of diseases. Uh, such resources were not available. We also uh, have no available uh, resources like list of all symptoms, list of all organs, uh, anatomical organs in Bulgaria, etc. And uh, because uh, we needed to, to do this uh, for a relatively short time, uh, we started uh, um, digging uh, the web and uh, searching for resources. Of course, uh, really nice resources can be found in bioportal there are available different mappings uh, of all those classifications and um, uh, ontologies and a really really good resource with uh, uh, structured information is wikidata wikidata actually uh, contains um, a lot of uh, information for instance here for covid 19 you can see um, the uh, labels. We, we try to explore multilinguality of uh, the labels in Wikidata. For instance, for COVID-19, you can see not only the English labels, uh, uh, also different alias uh, of uh, those labels, and also for different languages are available, uh, not only labels, but also different uh, synonyms of the term. Um, actually, uh, this uh, Wikidata resource uh, is uh, also a very good uh, resource uh, from which we can start because it contains not only labels in different uh, languages, but it contains also different references uh, to uh, those classifications. Um, we, we mentioned some uh, classifications. Um, uh, Wikidata is a collaborative uh, project, uh, which means uh, not for all terms we can find such rich uh, um, information. And uh, for some terms, uh, such information is available. For the others, uh, we have just limited um, um, links uh, to some uh, classifications and ontologies uh, for COVID-19 because it's uh, quite popular now. We have a very, very rich uh, representation and we have also reference uh, here to IC10, uh, uh, to disease ontology and to other uh, standard classifications. Um, we, we tried uh, with just uh, small sparkle queries uh, and from the wiki data query and point service uh, to check what is available for uh, those uh, mentioned uh, uh, classifications and ontologies uh, for Bulgarian. And uh, here you can see for this uh, very simple query, uh, are identified about 10,000 uh, uh, records uh, for 
um, the sizes uh, with uh, labels uh, in Bulgarian. And uh, here are also available uh, the ICD-10 codes, disease ontology codes, match mesh uh, codes, um, um, human phenotype ontology, Mondo, Orphanet, and etc. Um, actually, this results uh, same as good, but it's not good for our classification task because uh, in the ICD-10, we have uh, approximately 11,000 classes, and this is uh, less than one example per class. And uh, probably for some classes, uh, we lack any um, uh, data. And uh, the, the next task was uh, how to enlarge this corpora in order to generate automatically a training corpora uh, which will be sufficient uh, um, in size uh, 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 for our uh, extreme classification task uh, where we need to classify diagnoses to 11,000 classes. And uh, we applied uh, different mappings uh, uh, between ontologies because uh, I already mentioned Wikidata don't contain uh, all the uh, mappings uh, the uh, uh, resource and uh, here is uh, in World Health Organization ICD-10 um, classification. You can see how it's organized. Uh, uh, it has uh, uh, three uh, sign codes. Also, these uh, codes on the max level are uh, separated on uh, four uh, sign codes, etc. And uh, here, BioPortal is another linked open data resource, uh, which is uh, quite useful uh, for this task. Uh, again, using different uh, Sparkle queries uh, uh, and using uh, those ontologies and classifications um, in federated queries, uh, we can uh, map um, the trends uh, from uh, Wikidata to uh, that's uh, ontologies and uh, or in case some uh, terms from these ontologies are not available in Wikidata, we can also back propagate uh, those resources and we can feed the Wikidata with uh, these uh, terms. Also uh, here in uh, here, this is the human disease ontology are available some mappings and we can uh, benefit uh, from those uh, available mappings uh, to further um, uh, enlarge uh, our uh, mappings um, in our uh, uh, findings. We also use the queries not only for Bulgarian, but uh, for English, and we applied the machine translation for uh, from Bulgarian to uh, from English to uh, Bulgarian, from English to Latin, uh, and also uh, we applied uh, our transliteration uh, tools uh, from Latin to uh, Cyrillic. The resource which we used in addition, which is again a free. Uh, open resource. Uh, this is the alphabetical index. Uh, uh, this is translated in Bulgarian and provided by Ministry of Health uh, for uh, all uh, possible rules for uh, classification of diseases um, to different codes. Um, this uh, resource actually is not quite uh, good for processing because it was available in PDF format. And you can see here the references are in um, different uh, bullets for different levels and uh, very complicated tools uh, were developed uh, in order to extract the, the uh, particular references. For instance, here is uh, our treaties um, uh, with Kulites and it, it can be classified either with this code or with this code. Also, there are some references to other sources, and uh, actually, this one requires uh, to uh, process a lot of uh, information in such unstructured format. The, 
the final uh, resource which was uh, developed is uh, about uh, 370,000 uh, 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 for sign uh, uh, classifications for diagnosis and about 190,000 for three sign classifications of diagnosis. The uh, ICD-10 uh, codes uh, uh, per uh, different uh, uh, diagnoses are quite in balance. Here we can see for one of them, we have approximately 10,000 and there are a lot of uh, diagnoses for which we have just uh, one uh, entry in our uh, training resource. Um, here are uh, some of the automatically generated um, uh, resources for this classification task. Uh, here are uh, those um, diagnoses and uh, the first column are the associated uh, ICD-10 codes. This is a fully automatically uh, generated resource and uh, it uh, actually was uh, further validated and uh, a little bit cleaned uh, again semi-automatically on several iterations in order to ensure that all the phrases are valid uh, in the medical uh, terminology. Uh, for the tasks uh, which we are currently uh, aiming to apply are uh, classification with Slavic bird, multilingual bird, bio bird, and as a baseline, naive base and support vector machines. But uh, actually, those uh, transformers uh, based on bird uh, are trained on uh, just usual tasks and they require further um, uh, fine tuning uh, with terminology um, in Bulgarian for medical terms. That's why we wrote a lot of uh, resources uh, uh, which uh, are available on the web uh, and uh, are trusted resources like um, uh, medical um, scientific publications, uh, medical portals which are run by medical professionals and uh, they contain a lot of uh, uh, different uh, um, information for uh, this kind of uh, terminology. Um, another task which we're currently dealing is uh, uh, to, to generate synthetic corpora's uh, of uh, uh, patient records uh, because uh, there are a lot of regulations uh, for access uh, to such data. And uh, this is like chicken and egg. We need to develop tools, but we have no access to data in order to develop those tools. But those tools are necessary for processing this data. That's why we uh, try to generate uh, uh, partially from uh, uh, different sources which are available, um, so-called virtual patient uh, records. Uh, here you see a synthetically generated patient records for status, for patient status. Uh, this is uh, uh, might uh, 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 actually um, uh, in the same way like uh, extractive uh, summarization. We use the huge corpora uh, based uh, on the data uh, from the diabetes register where our, our sentence plotted uh, different uh, um, sentences uh, representing um, uh, organs and their status. And uh, this was uh, actually about 1 million sentences uh, corporal. And uh, on its basis uh, were automatically classified those uh, um, sentences uh, to uh, different organs and systems. And uh, this one actually allowed later to develop a uh, um, uh, synthetic patient status uh, uh, generation methods uh, uh, with uh, a lot of rules for constraints and for different combinations uh, of uh, uh, different uh, findings, uh, uh, which uh, is based uh, on this uh, uh, automatically uh, classified uh, corpora.
of uh, organ systems and uh, their strategies um, with really high accuracy. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, to uh, all the uh, colleagues uh, with which uh, I collaborated uh, for uh, clinical tax processing during the years. Uh, the first two are uh, Professor Gale Angelova and Dr. Zivko Angelov uh, from the Institute of uh, uh, Communication and uh, uh, and information and communication technologies uh, in Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we worked uh, with them in many, many projects. Uh, and actually, Zivko Angelov is the person who developed uh, the Bulgarian Diabetes uh, Register. Also, to Professor uh, Dimitri Churakchev from Medical University of Sofia, uh, who uh, uh, provided the data and uh, uh, he is uh, the expert uh, who is uh, consulting us uh, with uh, the tasks. And uh, last but not least, to a huge group of uh, very enthusiastic uh, students uh, from Faculty of Mathematics and, and Informatics uh, of Sofia University, supervised by Professor Ivan Koychev, and uh, also to PhD student Boris Belichkov, uh, who worked um, very enthusiastically uh, to the tasks uh, for um, creating resources, um, uh, to creating and developing uh, different tools for processing medical Bulgarian uh, texts. And uh, some acknowledgements uh, to two uh, uh, currently running projects. Uh, this is eHealth and uh, Isida funded by uh, Bulgarian National Science Fund, uh, to Ministry of Health, to National uh, Health Insurance Fund for providing some data and, ministry, and uh, medical university. And here are listed some previous uh, projects uh, uh, which uh, I uh, actually uh, mentioned as uh, results uh, for our first achievement. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to also to invite any questions. So I cannot see questions for the moment, neither on YouTube nor on uh, this chat, uh, but I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, so you mentioned that uh, one of, uh, part of your work was uh, implemented in a medical hospital in Bulgaria, correct? Yes, and yes. Um, this is uh, the specialized hospital for uh, endocrine and metabolic uh, disorders treatment in medical university. Uh, there, uh, actually, Professor Dimitar Cherakchev is uh, the head of the Department of Medical Informatics, and uh, we work with him for one of those or already finished projects. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, was it uh, was uh, your work actually used by pr practitioners for their work? Did you have any feedback from them? Um, th this is used uh, on daily basis uh, when uh, the patient is actually hospitalized, this uh, immediately is used. Uh, it requires actually frequent updates uh, and uh, probably some of the uh, uh, drugs and medications uh, should be more frequently uh, updated. The list of medications requires a lot of updates <laughs> on frequent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So there is one question uh, from Petya Osenova. Um, I will read it so everybody hears it. Uh, my question is whether in this task some paraphrasing techniques were used as well. Uh, yes, uh, we, we uh, actually we envisioned um, the paraphrasing uh, techniques uh, in all subtasks for text mining. Uh, uh, for some of uh, the uh, tasks, uh, actually, um, the uh, texts were processed as backup words, but for the other tasks uh, were used uh, different uh, uh, techniques uh, for data augmentation uh, using paraphrasing techniques. 
Okay, uh, Maria Gritz would like to ask a question. Um, yes, please do. No idea, probably she has to type it into the chat. Can you type it into the chat so I can, we can see it? Uh, actually, uh, uh, here is the question. Do you use semantic analysis of textual okay. data in order to map um, it uh, to an ontology? Actually, Wikidata uh, has a really good uh, disambiguation of the terms. Uh, and uh, once some term is uh, mapped to some of the ontologies, so we consider that this term is uh, already disambiguated as a medical term. And later, we use the mapping between different ontologies uh, in order to find the associated uh, ICD-10 code of the specific term. Uh, for for our classification task, uh, we uh, have uh, as an input actually one diagnosis, one sentence, which is one diagnosis, and we try to associate today's uh, diagnosis code, which means uh, we don't search for diagnosis inside in the code. We have all already um, focused the uh, uh, where the diagnosis is mentioned. And um, in case there are some other words, uh, actually, um, this is uh, uh, not a problem because uh, the classification task uh, is uh, able to associate uh, uh, not only single code, but also multiple codes because uh, this classification is not one to one, but uh, uh, it's one to many for one day. <laughs> possible to have several codes. In case I mentioned several diagnoses, we can receive also several codes uh, for each of them. So uh, I have another question in, in case you don't see any question anywhere. Um, uh, since this is a very critical domain, you know, the medical, um, uh, and actually, people who work with the medical know that if you make some mistakes uh, in the whatever, um, there can be some more serious consequences. How do you tackle the evaluation stage, uh, error analysis, stuff like this? Um, actually, we have a so-called human in the loop approach. We, we just uh, recommend something. This is not fully automated process. Um, also, uh, in the hospital, um, the, the doctor is able to see um, uh, actually where those medications are mentioned, uh, how they are identified, and to, to make some minor changes uh, in case are needed. Um, according to the classification tasks for diagnosis and codes, this is again a recommendation to which uh, aims uh, uh, to, to uh, fasten the process um, for um, uh, association of codes uh, to diagnosis, which is made by uh, medical practitioners. Uh, um, on the daily basis, uh, they need uh, for each diagnosis to assign the code. And uh, this too actually um, uh, suggests some possible codes and uh, the, the doctors are able to choose the most appropriate one. Good. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the answer. Are there any more questions? I think that there are no more questions, although it was a very, you know, intensive and interesting talk. Thank you very much for it. Um, okay, so let's go ahead with the with the next presenters. Thank you. So if you have, if anybody has any more questions, of course you can address them pri privately to the speaker, to the invited speaker. Uh, so and I need to to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah, sure, we wait for this. Oh, I, I'm not sure how to stop it. Maybe our technical stuff can um, help. They can probably change the presenter and this will stop. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, so um, our next presentation is uh, uh, on the topic of uh, bilingual lexi. It's the special session on word maths and ontologies. It's a nice continuation after um, uh, Professor Svetla Bojcheva's uh, invited talk. And uh, the next uh, presentation is you can clap, of course, if you can, but uh, I mean, there is no need, I guess. Um, so the next presentation is on the topic of um, a, lexic a bilingual lexical semantic uh, network on bread based on a parallel corpus. Um, um, I suppose it will be actually uh, presented by Ivan Derzhansky, who is already here um, from the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. So can you share you can you start sharing and uh, presenting? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I suppose everybody else also. Hello guys. Hello. Hello. Video. Okay. And Lord, let me try to share my screen and see what happens. Application, okay. Just a moment. So everybody hears you very well, I suppose. I mean, that's what I see. Presentation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you see my presentation now? We see it, yeah. Okay. So I'm Great. Well, thank questions. you. So this is part of our ongoing work on studying and comparing various segments of, of Bulgarian and Ukrainian lexicon and grammar using a parallel corpus that we have been developing. Why did we choose bread this time, uh, the topic of our interest? Why is bread important? Why is bread special? It's a central concept in Western civilization because bread and other bread-like products have been around for millennia, for, since time immemorial. So bread vocabulary is highly developed everywhere. But on the other hand, for many centuries, it has been developing separately so that uh, the words of different languages, the expressions don't match exactly. Uh, and this creates very complex and interesting relationships. Plus, uh, I'd point out that bread is a human product. It's produced by people and for people. So this semantic and lexical field is part of the anthropocentric image of the world and the anthropocentric vocabulary. The corpus that we use for this study, as well as a series of others, is uh, an ongoing project, as I said. Uh, it's composed of fiction, mostly novels, and some short stories as well. Its composition is not uh, so uh, central for this particular study, so I'm not going to dwell on it in detail. But anyhow, there are texts uh, which have been written originally in Bulgarian or in Ukrainian and translated into the other language. There are texts that have been written in a variety of other languages and translated into both Bulgarian and Ukrainian. In particular, the Bible forms a part of uh, the last edition of the corpus. And its total size currently is uh, 10 million words in Ukrainian and predictably a little more in Bulgarian, 11 and a half. Uh, so 21 and a half million words in the two languages in total. What we did was, first of all, we collected the principal bread words in Bulgarian and in Ukrainian. So in Bulgarian, the main lexeme is chlap, and uh, we also count uh, the diminutives, uh, the hypochoristic chlebets, and the diminutive chlepche, which leaves a life of its own, and uh, the meaning of small bread or roll. And the principal bread was in Ukrainian, the main lexeme chlib, and again, the diminutive chlebets, uh, which is little bread, diminutive or hypochoristic, and the chlibina, which means a loaf of bread, so it's a name of uh, a single entity, a single mm -hmm. item. So these are the main uh, bread words, uh, so to say. So we can uh, make uh, a tally of how many times they appear, how many times each of them corresponds to a word of, uh, the, of, of the other language. Uh, so again, a principal word, a derivative, or some other word. And so altogether, we found 1,634 enters of one word or the other. And uh, we made this table from which we can already make a few 
conclusions about how they behave. In particular, Bulgarian chlub is more readily used as a count noun, and Ukrainian chlub uh, is more likely to be a mass one. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'll make a short parenthetical remark here, uh, some, something interesting in the Bulgarian editions uh, of the Gospel, you know, the famous story about the feeding of uh, thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fishes. The Bulgarian texts tend to have Jesus asking, how many breads do you have? And the Ukrainian text, the question is, how much bread do you have? Mm -hmm. So this illustrates yes. uh, the point I was making. Uh, and it's more common for Bulgarian chlub than for Ukrainian chlub to correspond to a word with a different root. What those words are, we're going to see anon. For Bulgarian chlebche and Ukrainian chlub, it is even more common. Talking about words of different roots, uh, well, at the next stage, we started seeking out other corresponding words, or so words of the same lexical field, the same semantic field, but not cognate to, uh, to chlab and, and chlib. So we found the, the, uh, the occurrences where a word uh, uh, of, of this uh, set I was talking about corresponds to something else in the other language. The words we found this way formed the next layer and so on. Uh, we only chose words that denoted kinds of cooked dough, uh, baked, boiled or fried, or their parts, products, subproducts, uh, but not just dough. Not just flour, not just grain, not just gruel. You had to draw the line somewhere, although drawing the line was tricky sometimes. Um, it, it, it had the tendency of becoming blurry. But words that meant piece uh, of anything were only included when it was clear from the context uh, that bread or another relevant substance was meant, usually mentioned in the same sentence. Eventually, we ended up with a big set of uh, 91 Bulgarian lexemes and 110 Ukrainian lexemes, words related to bread, meaning bread in some sense, or able to mean bread in some sense, and a total number of 3,240 word pairs. Mm, the vast majority of these words, uh, uh, they are in an appendix to our paper. I'm not going to talk uh, in much detail about this now, but anyhow, they denote baker's goods specified for shape, so elongated, round, crescent, size, grain, um, oats, rye, uh, occasionally other substances as well. Presence of leaven, presence of a topping or filling, a taste, uh, sometimes savory or sweet, uh, or maybe unspecified for that, but uh, for, for something else in this sort. And the idea that the set of words had to be fully connected has uh, uh, the corollary that some words were not taken, although being semantically appropriate by their definition. So, for example, the Bulgarian word agnolotti, well, agnolotti in Bulgarian uh, carried over from an Italian text, agnolotti. Uh, the word pelmeni, which again uh, appears in the translation from Russian, uh, um, but it's used nowadays in Bulgarian also, Russian dumplings. Ukrainian pelmeni, these words were not taken because there was no connection from them to chlab uh, in any way uh, in the corpus. We could delineate a number of semantic categories in this. Uh, as I said, uh, there are words that denote bread, uh, words that denote uh, other items of various sorts, words that denote whole units of bread, so um, a loaf of bread or a cake of bread, as we say in English, or a piece of bread. Uh, and the piece of bread can be uh, a, a part that is being cut off, a part that has been uh, uh, torn off, uh, broken off, uh, something from the center, from, from the outside, uh, the crust, uh, whatever. Uh, or sometimes we find words that mean a piece of food uh, or of anything, but usually bread, uh, kind of English mouthful or slice. And finally, words that mean the piece of anything and that, and, that, and that simply can be applied to bread and sometimes are and often are in the corpus. Mm. And by comparing how many times these words appear and how many times they correspond to one another, again, we can uh, find uh, some interesting tendencies. You see the table here, uh, we, and you see that Bulgarian has a greater fondness of the word chlab itself. And the terms for units and pieces of bread, big and small. So those of uh, in the audience who are speakers of Bulgarian know how often we find words like uh, filia, zalek, komat, uh, words that actually refer to 
a piece of bread specifically. Ukrainian is not uh, uh, so fond of these particular words. Uh, it tends to use words for special kinds of baker's goods and also often uses general words for pieces of food uh, and words for a for, for piece of anything uh, in general. We can make a big table of correspondences uh, and to see how often uh, one Bulgarian lexeme corresponds to some Bul uh, Ukrainian lexeme out of these uh, lists. Uh, as I said, there's about a about hundred words in each, each language. So obviously a table hundred by hundred would be too big to fit on the slide here. But here's the upper left corner with the most frequent words. Um, so words for bread and words for sandwich. And then the others that follow tend to differ in Bulgarian. You find the word pitka, little cake, in position number three, and then torta, which is uh, a condition as cake, kind of a birthday cake. Uh, then we find slatkish, something sweet, parche, which is a general word for, for, for peace. In Ukrainian, we find tort, uh, a condition as cake, in third position, then perich, a pie. Korj, uh, which tend to mean again uh, a cake, uh, a flat thing. Shmatok, a general I think, word for peace. You can see that uh, generally they tend to correspond to one another more or less uh, following their frequencies. So the most frequent words correspond to one another most often. And then the words for sandwich do the same. And then the tendency is kind of preserved, but there is a bit of uh, uh, stray from, from time to time also. So as I said, we have a lot of data here, things about words corresponding to one another. What's going to happen if we put this in a net? If we try to draw a graph in which each Bulgarian and Ukrainian lexical unit has a node corresponding to it, and there is an edge drawn between them, if there is at least one match, uh, ignoring for the time being uh, the number of times they, th this match appears. So if, if it appears at least once in the corpus, we draw an edge. And we end up with, with uh, almost 400 edges, you know, 395 to be precise. If we draw the graph uh, so as to make it as balanced as possible, uh, so that uh, uh, in the center we want to put a word from which any other word can be reached with uh, as a short a path as possible, as few moves as possible, then a candidate for the center would be Bulgarian pitka, bread roll, because from this word any other can be reached in five moves at most. And the greatest distance between two nodes is nine edges. And this is what the network looks like uh, eventually. As I said, Pitka is uh, at the very center. And we have uh, words uh, that are as far as possible in sense uh, located uh, at the periphery. So for example, at the very top, the two uh, words uh, that are you know, located in the highest position in the, in the diagram are marzipan, and Bademovka, which is essentially the same thing in Bulgarian, uh, meaning something made of almonds. And at the left, uh, we have uh, uh, Ukrainian tortik, which is a small conditional cake, and the trubochka and batonchik, a pipe made of wafer. What is interesting is that uh, here in the, in the graph, uh, we can see groups of words with similar meanings located uh, uh, so to say, uh, geographically, geometrically close together. So I have outlined uh, the lower right corner, which is words for pieces. You know, those words uh, that uh, form separate semantic categories, as I said, uh, uh, they are located close together. Hmm. So from the position, the allocation of words in the graph, we can uh, tell something about how close their meanings are to one another according to our corpus. Uh, still, because this network is uh, rather hard to observe, uh, we can try to shorten it somewhat by only leaving some of the edges, uh, because uh, arguably some of the edges are the artifact of translation from third languages, and actually they connect words with substantially different meanings. So one way to 
shorten the network is by taking only all those word pairs that appear in text found uh, where Bulgarian or Ukrainian is the original languages, language. Mm, this is somewhat less than one quarter of uh, the examples from the corpus. And uh, so what is left is uh, uh, about half of the lexemes, 141 edges. Mm, this gives us the graph on this page, uh, it is no longer all interconnected because we cut off some links that don't appear in the Bulgarian or Ukrainian sector of the corpus. So it's somewhat more observable. And uh, as you can see, again, in the lower right uh, uh, part of this area, we see the words uh, denoting pieces uh, grouped together. And there are some other parts of uh, the network also where words uh, close together are located uh, in uh, uh, closely uh, tied closely in its sectors a third way of uh, shortening the network making it more observable as i said is excluding part of the correspondences by choosing them among the ones that are least uh, that um, uh, that are least well supported by corpus data but doing so with the condition that if two words, word pairs share a word and one is more frequent than the other, then we may not drop the first and keep the second. So we really choose the corresponses that are best supported by corpus data out of the lot. So if we try to choose as few edges as we can while observing this condition, we end up with a network with 251 edges. Again, Bulgarian Pitka, uh, right or all, located in the center, uh, seven edges away from the most distant nodes, which are Ukrainian hostia and Ukrainian Krishka. Hostia is a host, uh, communion wafer, and Krishka means a crumb. And the greatest distance is 13 edges. Uh, so this is what it looks like. And it has the same uh, feature that we can select uh, parts of, the net of, of this network where words of uh, similar meanings are grouped together. So I'm not going to talk about in much detail about this. Uh, I want to mention the last uh, experiment that we ran uh, for this study to relax the requirement that the edges from each node must be chosen among the most frequent ones and simply take as many edges as are needed to keep the system fully connected. Uh, so since we have 201 nodes in altogether, so that means 200 node, uh, edges are needed to connect them. The graph looks like a tree. It is not, in fact, a tree because the edges are not directed. So the reason we put uh, a node on top of the tree, uh, that's Bulgarian Pitka again, is not because uh, it is in some, in some uh, way uh, really at, at top, uh, a root of a tree, but because it is kind of central. So from it, any other node can be reached in no more than 14 moves. Another candidate would be Ukrainian Korj. And the largest distance in this tree is uh, 27 edges. And this tree has the feature that uh, semantically web well formed subsets of uh, words of the two languages uh, can be identified as subtrees. Uh, so we have uh, one such subtree near the, near the top, which includes Pitka, the word I mentioned which is on the top, and a, new, a number of words denoting types of uh, bread by context, by content near it. And then there is a, a big uh, sector at the left, uh, the left-hand side, uh, those are the pieces again, and a small sector in the left, uh, in the left half, uh, which is words for, uh, for various sandwiches, uh, not necessarily kinds of sandwiches, actually it's more like synonyms uh, in Ukrainian denoting sandwiches, so words like sandwich, butterbrot, uh, kanapka, uh, and so on, um, hamburger for, for that matter, hamburger. And then there's another subtree in the right hand uh, part, in the little lower than the types of bread by context, there's uh, words meaning various desserts. Um, so Bulgarian Slotkish is uh, at the top of, of this word and uh, confectioner uh, products uh, located below it. Mm. 
so this is um, a particularly interesting graph that uh, we got as a result of um, of uh, this study. What we would point out as valuable traits of the approach is it was highly formalized. The sequence of actions is uh, precisely outlined and uh, carried out in an automatic way and can be applied to any field defined by a certain concept. Uh, so in a way it is universal. Uh, it reflects uh, both the generalized translation experience embodied in the parallel texts um, and uh, the fruits of lexicography embodied in the respective interpretative dictionaries of the two languages. Uh, it's objective because uh, being formal and being automat uh, automatic, uh, the procedure uh, reduces the subjective component in the research. It is comprehensive uh, because uh, the multilinguality of the sources increases the diversity of detected entries, you know, the, parallel, uh, the, the presence of parallel translation from third languages also. And we can uh, build a network on the base of two languages for both languages simultaneously. Which is not to say that uh, there is not a lot of work to be done from this point on. There are many ways to further enrich the network, uh, embellish it and making it uh, more adequate for particular tasks. Uh, so one thing we can do is label every edge by the numeric value, which reflects its relevance. So the number of occurrences, but keep the edges in place. We can make the edges directed by having them point from the less frequent to the more frequent lexeme, which is often going to make them correspond to uh, an, a kind of relation. We can correct the weight of, or the weight of an edge based on the number of sectors of tech or texts in which it is encountered, because sometimes we find uh, edges connecting lexemes that uh, we feel uh, should be, be interpreted as having different semantics. And we find that this is because in some particular text, uh, some particular translator made them correspond to one another. So if you want to reduce the weight of, uh, of this kind of phenomenon, we can introduce the correction I mentioned. And we can also add information from interpretative dictionaries and monolingual corpora, including dialect data, because uh, it, it is a fact that uh, dialects uh, include uh, a wealth of terminology that our corpus probably does not reflect, uh, but might, in fact, because dialect uh, uh, lexicon is, uh, of course, um, available to translators, but they don't always uh, have uh, the incentive to use it and uh, comparing coverage and combining results with similar networks uh, built by other deductive and inductive methods is uh, always uh, a potentially fruitful way of uh, increasing the and um, improving the information that we cover. So thank you for your attention and um, we're open to questions. Thank you very much for uh, interesting presentation. And uh, just to say that uh, there is one question uh, in YouTube uh, from um, Radovan Garabik. Uh, I will read it now. Uh, naive question, maybe I just missed it. Does the Ukrainian clip uh, also mean grain? And if it does, was it removed from the word pairings? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, it very much does so. And as a matter of fact, it is an important fact that Ukrainian chlib means grain much more often than Bulgarian chlib does, although Bulgarian chlib has this meaning also. It was removed from the word pairings for this particular experiment. Because we only wanted to compare words, as I said, for for baked uh, for bakers' products. But uh, in another study, we do plan to look at this as well. And so the, the the way the condition, the frequency, and so on. Uh, so uh, which, Bible which Bible translations were used? I see. I'm being asked. Uh, uh, well, shall we say uh, the principal ones? Uh, uh, the um, uh, Holy Synod's uh, translation into Bulgarian and Ivan Ohienko's translation into Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are also other so, questions. Oh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, uh, yes. Did you map this? Uh, did you map them uh, to, 
in the WordNet to get the named relations? Not yet, but again, uh, this is something that we intend to do. Uh, it is uh, one of the things that I mentioned in the last slide as uh, part of the future paths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, of course, we do uh, intend to do that. We just wanted to see for this, but on this occasion, we want to see what information our corpus was going to give us. Uh, but yes, we intend to enrich the network uh, with sources, in, uh, including the WordNet. So there are two, there are two questions uh, in uh, YouTube. Um, no, actually, yeah. one is uh, so actually probably one question from Krasimira Petrova. Uh, would you suggest to change the translation of the line from God's Prayer, Chleb Nash Nasushni Daini Dnes, this is in Bulgarian, into another languages and cultures replacing with rice, corn? Uh, question Fish continues. and cloud. The question continues. <laughs> Obviously, in Ukrainian is Chleb uh, is Karvam Sichlava. Do you, uh, maybe this is another question, do you do you study proof the old proverb? Uh, what was the last sentence, sorry? Uh, do you study proof the, the old proverb? But if you want, we can address the first question first. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes, it is, a, it, it is a known fact that different words are used in some languages for translating uh, our daily bread. Uh, we, we've heard of fish. Uh, in some Inuit translations as well. Uh, and it is a fact, again, uh, something that we did not include in this particular study, but it is part of uh, the of, of, of the bigger project uh, on the studying bread in general, that bread can mean food. Uh, in, well, it, have the, it, has, it can have the general meaning of food. It can have the general meaning of um, um, well, Propitani uh, uh, in, in so uh, <laughs> I'm trying to living in well living in English is very general, but anyhow the things one eats, things one lives with. Uh, so we in, do intend to look at the frequency of this as well. Uh, obviously, we're being asked whether we have observations on other languages, particular other Slavic languages, or not. In this occasion, I think Russian is going to be kind of similar to Ukrainian, but to what extent precisely remains to be seen. And yes, of course, it would be interesting to look at uh, other Slavic languages uh, as well, mm. or for that matter, something that we can e do easily enough is uh, look at uh, what happens in. Uh, the languages that our translations were made from, because mm -hmm. we do have text translated from Polish, text translated from Russian. Uh, so looking at those is uh, an obvious next step that we can take, just to see how big the variety of red words is in those languages. So I, I think you probably answered. Uh, so I have the suspicion that they, this may be two different questions. But oh, so uh, in Ukrainian is "chleb uh, piskarom sichliabo." Do you study proof the old, proof the old proverb? Did you already answer this question? Piskarom sichliabo zarobatvish na chleb. Zarobliat na chleb. Yes, zarobliat na chleb does exist in Ukrainian also. Uh, and whether it is more frequent uh, uh, than Bulgarian is or not, uh, as I said, with a separate study. So metaphoric meanings of the word uh, of, 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 of the word are, as I said, something we did not look at on this occasion. We only wanted literal uses, but metaphoric mm -hmm. meanings are well a separate project, separate yeah, yeah, talk yeah. sometime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, for the presenter, maybe there is something in your, in your chat. Maybe somebody wrote to you privately a question. Can you check? Um, I'm monitoring the chat. I think I answered what uh, uh, I think okay. I answered the things that I see here. And if there are any others, uh, well, I'm available. Yes, uh, I have uh, one very short question. So, um, can you? Um, um, just give examples of what kind of applications uh, that uh, your work can actually be useful for, like practical applications. Practical applications, you say? Yeah. Well, for one thing, it can be used uh, as a translator's resource because it it, it is the, the nucleus, shall we say, of um, a lexical database. 
Uh, so we end up with a number of translator of, of, of translation pairs, uh, bilingual translation pairs, Bulgarian Ukrainian, with the information on their frequency. Um, and perhaps uh, if we want, so are we still connected? Yes, yes, we can hear yeah, you. Okay. Okay, so my, my screen went blank, so I, I wonder what was going on. Uh, so we we can produce information on what uh, Ukrainian words, uh, a certain Bulgarian word has been found to correspond to and vice versa, which can be compared to the data in uh, a bilingual dictionary. Mm -hmm. And then we can discuss the reasons for the differences, uh, if any, uh, which there are going to be a number of, a number of times. Uh, so this is one possible direct practical use that uh, I can think of. Um, otherwise, uh, we're more thinking of uh, this providing information for further theoretical studies, so for example, in translations, translation studies. So if we find some kind of uh, uh, correspondence pair in uh, one text, uh, but not in others, then there may be some reason for that that we might want to look at uh, why that is, what prompted the translator to do something unusual in, in some particular occasion and so on. So there's a number of questions that uh, this can provoke. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you and very thank much. You. Yeah, and thank you for the presentation. We know that, that for Bulgaria and also for other languages, uh, breadth is a very important topic. Uh, so um, let's start with the next presentation. And if any, if there are any more questions, please direct them directly to the to the speaker and the authors. So the next presentation uh, will be on the topic of um, uh, customizable WordNet editor. Uh, it will be presented by Andrei Marius Avram, who is uh, here. Um, we have, uh, can you please uh, uh, unmute yourself okay. and just, yes, uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Yeah, just to tell Hi. you, please follow your chat so that uh, I can show you how many, me, how many minutes are left until the end of your talk and uh, then at the end when uh, people start typing questions. Okay. okay please, okay. please go on. Okay, I, I will start to share the presentation. One second. Uh, can you see it? It's everything okay? Uh, hello? Yes, yes, so we can see it. Can you make it full screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, hi, my name is Andre, and I will present my work with Virginica Barbu for this conference, which is a uh, a WordNet editor for we that uh, lexicographs and linguists can use to edit WordNets. So, what is the current state of uh, WordNets community nowadays? WordNets are still used in state-of-the-art mode, uh, in state-of-the-art tasks like uh, word sense disintegration or uh, in uh, grouping together word debatings that are semantically correlated. Also, uh, there are projects for building and extending the WordNets either in the traditional way or in adding audio and visual information to them. And moreover, uh, an interesting direction is to create uh, standardized format uh, that ensures interlinking, interlinking between uh, WordNets and other resources. And uh, now let's talk a bit about the Romanian WordNet. It, its development started in the Balkanet project between 2001 and 2004, and uh, it uh, adopted the expand method from the Princeton WordNet where you take the Princeton graph and you take the since you take the scene sets, you translate it definition, you import the relations and the literals. And uh, 
about year, eight years ago, uh, our editor uh, uh, got in copy of, got in copy double with the internet with the newer version and uh, with the newer version of Internet Explorer and JavaScript. So we started to develop a new version for uh, editing the WordNet. Okay, the Romanian literals also have a special sense in numbering where there is a hierarchy of senses. Of the main sense of a literal is marked by an integer like one, a substance is marked by a number dot a number, and the sub substance is marked by a number dot a number dot a number. Also, we have two special marks, X and C. Uh, the X denotes so words that don't have a direct translation in the dictionary, but their literals uh, exist in Romania corpora. And we also have dot C that marks uh, literals that uh, can exist in multiple synsets. And that shows that the respective synsets can be semantically clustered. Okay. So uh, what were the main aims in uh, our development of RowerNet Editor? The first one was lightweight. We wanted the application to be fast and not have too much uh, uh, overheat. Uh, and uh, this is why we choose the Flask framework, which is a lightweight framework and comes only with the basic tools for web development. And you can add uh, the tools that you want to it in an ad hoc manner. Another thing that we wanted was the system to be portable. And uh, for this, uh, we developed the application to have only Python dependencies that can be easily installed with the PyP interface. Uh, so the application does not have uh, any system dependencies. Another point that we wanted was maintainability. So we could easily add new features or remove or old ones. And also Flask is a widely used and easy to learn framework, so a software engineer can easily adapt to it. Uh, the last point was flexibility. Uh, we didn't want our editor to be only for the Romanian WordNet. We also wanted to be able to work on other WordNets for other languages. So, uh, as long as they respect the XML format of our WordNet. Okay. Uh, the application also have a graphical interface that it's intuitive to use and allows the user to uh, select synthesis, to create new ones, to edit them. And it can be accessed through a web browser. Here in the left, we have a screenshot of how it looks like and uh, I will have a slide where I will present a demo of how it works. Okay. Uh, this is the system architecture and how the application behaves. Uh, first of all, when you enter the application, it will be shown a main page where uh, synsets, where, from where you can select the synsets that you can create. Uh, when you select a scene set, you will be redirected to a page where you can create it. You will complete these fields. And when you create it, uh, there are two options depending on uh, your status in the application, whether you are a novice user or a lexicograph. So if you are a lexicograph, you will directly slave the uh, scene set in the WordNet. And if you are a novice, your synset will be added to a request list, and then a lexicograph can look uh, into your requested synset and can either accept, edit, or reject it. Okay. Uh, now let's talk a bit about the synset selection algorithm. 
uh, the editor has an automatic uh, way of suggesting unimplemented synsets. And how does it do that? Uh, it exploits the partial mapping between the Romanian warnet and the Princeton warnet. So uh, it selects the synsets that exist in Princeton warnet, but uh, not in the warnet, and have at least one edge with a synsets that is already implemented in Romanian WordNet. For instance, in this graph, the green nodes are the common synsets between the Romanian WordNet and the Princeton WordNet. And the red, one, the red nodes are the synsets that have that are not implemented in the Romanian WordNet, but are implemented in the Princeton WordNet, and that have at last one edge with a synset that is implemented in Romanian. And these read nodes will be the ones that will that will be suggested to the, by the application. Also, we have here the white ones that are nodes that are not implemented in the Romanian WordNet, but they don't have an edge with uh, an already implemented synset, common synset. Okay, uh, the synset creation is pretty easy. You are directed to a page where you complete the definitory fields of synset, its definition, lemmas, also the stamp. Uh, you can add uh, any number of lemmas through a button and you also can remove them. Also, there is a non lexicalized button. And if you check it, the, the, sins, the respective synset will, will, will not have any lemmas. And when the synset is created, the application will automatically import all the relations from the Princeton Warnet, uh, uh, relations that are linked to already implemented Romanian synsets. Okay. Uh, the authorization mechanism, as I said, the application has two types of users, the novice and the lexicographer. Uh, the role of the lexicographer is to supervise the activity of the novice user by accepting, editing, or rejecting its synsets. Uh, we implemented this mechanism because we wanted to assure consistency in the WordNet and by allowing only a specialized user to edit uh, its structure. Okay. So here is the demo. I hope it will load. Okay, uh, this is a video. I will start it and I will show how the application works. Uh, I, I have a quick question. Can you hear the sound or do I have to talk? Uh, are you hearing I, what I'm saying or uh, oh, yeah, it's yeah, only the video? It's, oh, okay. Uh, okay, so you can hear it. Okay. Oh, we cannot hear actually the recorded oh, voice. Oh, okay, okay. I was okay. so I will talk uh, with the video. Okay, so this is the login page. Uh, you have here the default account. Uh, you can create more accounts from the uh, from a script. Uh, uh, its usage is based on the repository page. Okay. Okay. Uh, when you log in, you will be redirected to a page where the synsets, where the suggested synsets are displayed with their definition in English, their lemmas and their relations. Uh, you can click on any of them to be redirected to the created uh, where you will be redirected to the creation page. Uh, at the creation page, you have uh, 
the, you can complete the definitory fields of a scene set, like its definition, adding lemmas, removing lemmas. And you also, on the top of the page, you have uh, its definition in English and uh, its lemmas in English, together with, uh, uh, with their senses. Uh, okay. Here I'm explaining that. Here I completed the since the definition. Here is how you add lemma by clicking the button add lemma. You complete the fields, lemma one, for instance, and sense one. I added another lemma, which is lemma two and sense two. And by you by clicking the button remove lemma, uh, the application will remove the last lemma you added. Uh, once you complete and you are okay with the fields, you can uh, click the create scene set button. The application will automatically import all the necessary relationships and you'll be redirected again to the main page where you can select a new scene set to implement. Uh, as I said, uh, we didn't want the application to be developed only for the Romanian language. We wanted it to be able to work on other, on other warnets. And uh, there are two uh, conditions to be able to do that. First of all, the XML, for, the XML format of the replacing warnet has to respect the XML format of the Romanian warnet. And also the warnet must be derived from the Princeton warnet. So here I have an example of how the, of how the uh, Romanian warnet XML looks like. Uh, it contains uh, a group of synsets delimited by the synset tag. Uh, in the synset tag, we have the ID of the synset, the part of speech, the synonym tag, which marks the literals. Each literal has a, a word and the sense. Uh, it ha each synset has a stamp, uh, the incoming relation and their type, hypernym, hypernym, and the definition. Uh, the Romanian Warnet uh, XML also has the domain Salmo and Centwin, but uh, you don't have to, but the current version of the editor doesn't use them, so you don't have to implement them in your XML format. Uh, in conclusion, the paper introduces the RawWarnet editor, an application that uh, facilitates the extension of uh, WarNet buffer in the intuitive graphical interface. Uh, it has an algorithm that automatically suggests new scene sets by comparing the Romanian Warnet and the Princeton Warnet, and also an authorization mechanism that ensures consistency by allowing only a authorized person to modify the structure of the Warnet. And the application can also be customized by customized to allow editing any other Warnet, not only the Romanian as long as its respect is format. Okay, so this was my presentation. Thank you. If there are any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, thank you for showing us the demo. Um, so are there any questions? Thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation. I've got a question. Um, so is there a possibility of using the application you are presenting to map synsets against uh, units of an ontology. This could be useful in case uh, you want to use a word net as an ontology lexicon. Uh, I don't think we have this capability yet. I don't think. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.
So there is one question in um, YouTube from Radovan Garabik. Is it strictly tied to PWN or, it, or can it work with other language pair than starting from English? Uh, it's strictly Princeton Warnet. Uh, in the background, we use uh, the NLTK implementation of the Princeton Warnet. So yeah, it's basically the Princeton Warnet. It has to be derived from it. Okay, uh, he said thank you. Um, uh, ah, okay. There is uh, there is question in the in the chat. There are several questions in the chat. Do you see them? So uh, let me should yeah. I read them so everybody hears them. Uh, what is the format of the XML? Did you try to use standards like LMF, uh, EEI, etc.? Uh, the format of the XML was presented here. I didn't try to use any standardized format for the application. Maybe in a future work, I will try to use the standardized and to translate the Romanian word into the standardized. Okay, um, there is another question in the chat uh, from Svetlana Neseva. Do you use the XML files alone or have you implemented a database? Uh, the XML files alone. Uh, as I said, it doesn't have uh, any other dependencies, so a database will be a system dependency on the file. Okay, so there are other questions. Uh, so one in YouTube, I will read it first because it, it came first from uh, Marisa Grizel. Is there a way to add, uh, since it's not connected to Princeton to Warnet, uh, as a standalone scene sets? Uh, currently, there is no, it's not possible to do that uh, because uh, the first step in the application is to suggest scene sets and then to select one and implement it. There is no way, no other way around that. So they have to be connected to the Princeton Warnet. Okay, uh, I will read another question in YouTube and then uh, jump to the chat because there are really a lot of questions for you. Um, a question from Svetu Koeva, there are some language specific cases in which uh, Princeton Warnet semantic relations are not uh, applicable. Can you remove or add a relation? Uh, you cannot remove the relations. They're automatically imported. Yeah, this this will be uh, an interesting feature to add. I mean, to be redirected when you create it to another page where it will display also the relations. Okay, so there is one uh, question here in, uh, in the chat from Virginia Camitello. Um, Rome is available in a standardized format in the open multilingual WordNet project. Uh, sorry, that was uh, my answer to, uh, to answer. yeah, to yeah. Evo. Okay. <laughs> sorry, uh, but there is uh, Svetlozara's uh, question that is left unanswered yet. Yeah, I didn't. No, actually, he answered it. I read it. Do you use uh, the XML files alone, or have you implemented the database? He already answered this. Yeah. Uh, but there is sorry. A... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Betty Osanova. Is it intended to take into account the collaborative interlingual index at some point? Now there is a new version of the Princeton WordNet called the English WordNet. Uh, uh, we are you answering to, Vir to Virginica then. Yes, I answered. <laughs> Sorry, okay. because it was in written form and I could. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we do, you do intend to do this. So I'm. Uh, we need to tell this because there is also people. There are people uh, watching in YouTube, so uh, we need to tell this by voice. Okay. okay, I think that basically, are there any more questions? I think you you got a lot of questions. Um, in YouTube, there is no more question and um, no more questions in the chat, except if I missed something here. No, I think um, we answered all questions. You answered all questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, then uh, we can actually, uh, yeah, all clear. So uh, we can actually finish uh, for the moment and continue with the coffee break.
until uh, 12. And then we'll continue with the continuation of the, the special sessions on WordNet uh, and uh, uh, ontologies. Thank you very much again. Uh, now a coffee break for uh, half an hour, 35 minutes.
time for the next uh, part of the special session on Warnet and uh, Ontology. Um, I'm Maria Todorova and I will be the chair of the special session. Um, so, are we ready to continue? Or should we wait a little bit more? Well, the second part. The second part of the special session on Wordnet and Ontologies continues with a um, talk of Angelina Volshina and Natalia Lukocevic from Romanosov Moscow State University. Uh, and the topic is comparison of genres in word sense and in word using sentences and relation using automatically generated text collection. So I give the word to Angelina to present their work. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, so can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Uh, thank you. Yes, Yes. So, um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Once again, uh, this is our um, collaborative work with uh, Natalia Valentina Lukashevich. And uh, the subject of our research is a comparison of genres in word sense disambiguation using automatically generated uh, text collections. Uh, so, Word sense disambiguation um, is the task that uh, consists of assigning the correct sense of the polysemous word in a given context. Uh, word sense disambiguation is used in many semantic oriented applications, uh, such as, for example, semantic information retrieval, um, machine translation, various uh, knowledge graphs, and uh, lexical semantic resources. And uh, to achieve high performance, uh, supervised word sense disambiguation algorithms require large sense annotated collections. But usually, um, the annotation of such collections uh, demands considerable uh, human expert uh, effort and it is very time consuming. Uh, so, word sense disambiguation algorithms suffer from uh, the problem that is called knowledge acquisition bottleneck. And uh, one of the possible solutions to this problem is automatic generation of um, training collections and uh, automatic labeling of those collections. And in our research, we present um, the method that relies on a monosomous relatives approach to uh, automatically generate and label training collections. Uh, so, monosomous relatives are those unambiguous words and word phrases that are connected to the target ambiguous words through some semantic relation. Um, and monosomous relatives approach is based on the substitution. So, we find the text in which uh, such relative is used then we substitute this word with uh, the target polysemous word, and then we label this context with the sense of the monosemous relative. And usually, semantic graphs such as uh, WordNet are used uh, as a source for such relatives. And in our case, we used uh, Russian uh, thesaurus through WordNet to extract uh, monosemous relatives. 
In the examples below, we present uh, some of the monosonous relatives for the two senses of uh, the polysemous word doctor. Um, however, this method has some drawbacks. For example, some senses of the target polysemous word may not have monosonous relatives. And uh, some contexts of monosonous relatives may add um, noise to the training data. And in our research, we try to address those issues. Uh, here is outline of our report today. Uh, first, we are going to describe um, the data that we use in our research, uh, that is uh, RuvodNet Thesaurus and different corpora. Um, then we will tell you about uh, the principal features of our algorithm, that is uh, the distance to the monosomous relatives, the concept of uh, synthesis nest, and um, similarity scores. Uh, then we will present a um, step-by-step description uh, of our algorithm. Also, then we will overview the methods. Uh, two methods of compiling training collections. And then we will demonstrate uh, the results of our experiments with uh, different training collections, uh, different contextualized word embeddings. Uh, and finally, we will show some additional findings that concern the genres of training and test collections and their impact on the resulting performance of the word sense disambiguation systems. So, um, in our research as an underlying semantic uh, network, we used uh, RuvodNet Thors. Uh, it is a semantic network for the Russian language that has a WordNet-like structure. It uh, consists of um, around uh, 63,000 monosomous words and uh, 2,892 polysemous words. We use this uh, resource, resource to uh, extract semantic relations between polysemous words and their monosomous relatives. Uh, we also exploited this graph to measure the, dist um, to measure the distance between um, polysemous words and its relatives. And also we have taken the sense inventory uh, from this uh, thesaurus. Now to the data sets that we use in our research. Um, first, we use uh, two different opera, which differ in uh, genre. The first one is uh, the news corpus, uh, and uh, it con contains uh, around one million news articles harvested from various news sources. Uh, and the next one is uh, Taiga Prozaru uh, corpus. That is, uh, Prozeru is uh, the segment of a very big uh, corpus that is called Taiga. And Prozeru corpus um, is compiled uh, of the works of prose fiction. So uh, we display on the slide uh, the um, characteristics of those uh, opera. Uh, we use um, those corpus to investigate uh, whether the genre of the training corpus has an impact on the performance on the test data set for word sense disambiguation systems. Uh, next, to evaluate um, our algorithm of uh, automatic uh, training data collection, we used uh, three distinct RUSE 18 uh, data sets for Russian. From these data sets, we have taken only those words and senses that have a uh, one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, the senses in RuvodNet Thesaurus. So we compiled a test data set that consists of uh, the context for 30 target ambiguous nouns. And each noun um, has two different senses. For convenience, we call this data set a Russia RuvodNet data set. We also created a small data set um, that consists of word sense definitions and examples of uses from Ozhegov dictionary for every target polysemous word. 
and each sense of uh, a polysemous word has a definition and between one and three usage examples. And this training collection was used uh, to train uh, a baseline solution for the word sense disambiguation task. So next to our approach, uh, in different works, synonyms, hyponyms, and hypernyms are used as monosimous relatives. Uh, they are located very close to the target parisimus word in a semantic graph, and that makes them more reliable monosimous relatives. So they don't require any sophisticated additional verification procedure. Uh, however, as we have already said, um, for some senses of uh, polysemous words, we may not find uh, such close relatives. And so the central idea of our method is that a training collection can be built not only with the direct relations like synonymy, hyponymy, hypernomy, but also with far more distant ones. For example, co-hyponyms, two steps or more hyponyms and hypernyms. So, for example, um, most contexts for the word uh, krona in the sense of uh, krona currency match the context of um, the other words denoting currency like anglisky funt, pound sterling, because they have common hypernym uh, valuta currency. So we can see that uh, for, a poly uh, for the polysemous word um, krona, uh, the context with uh, it's um, hyponyms like Anglisky Funt, they're good training examples. So we can add them to a training collection. Um, and advantage, uh, the advantage of our approach is that we can find a lot more monosimous relatives for target polysemous um, words on such uh, distances. But uh, the disadvantage is that we have to score all those relatives and we need to check their context so that they will suit um, uh, as training samples and uh, to measure the suitability of a monosimous candidate to display a private sense of a polysemous work we exploit a notion of a sensitive nest the sensitive nest consists of the synonyms to a target sense and normal words from directly related senses within two steps from a target uh, listener's word. And uh, in the following example, we present uh, a fragment of the sensitiveness for a word uh, taxa uh, in the meaning um, breed of dog. Uh, then Another important part of our selection algorithm is the similarity score. We uh, use similarity scores between a candidate monosimous relative and a sensitiveness to evaluate how well this candidate can represent the sense of an ambiguous word. Moreover, we check uh, similarity scores to the sensitiveness for every monosimous relative because a word described as monosimous in the thesaurus can actually have polysemous usage in a corpus. For example, uh, the Russian word iriska, toffee, can also denote a nickname of Everton Football Club, uh, the toffees. So we can see that the usage of candidate um, monosimous relatives in the source corpus should be further checked. So it won't add any noise to the training collection. Now let us turn to our algorithm itself. Um, the selection and ranking method consists of the following steps. First, we extract all the candidate monosimous relatives within four steps from a target polysemous word. Then we compile the synthesis nest um, of the target sense. And then for each candidate monosimous relative, we find 100 most similar words according to the uh, Wotovec model trained on the corresponding corpus. We then uh, intersect these uh, top uh, 100 words 
with the words included in the synset nest. The final weight uh, of the synset in the synset nest is determined by the maximum weight among all the words that represent the synset in the intersection. Uh, the total score of the monosomous candidate is the sum of the weights of all the synsets from the synset nest. So the final weight uh, of the candidate can be defined as follows, and the formula is given at the bottom of the slide. So our method implies that more scores are assigned to those candidates that resemble a greater number of synsets from the synset nest. Um, the following fragment of list of uh, monosomous relatives with um, respective similarity scores that are given in brackets uh, were obtained for the noun Vazdika in its uh, two senses, connation and club. Uh, we see that all monosomous relatives are sorted by the weight they, that they obtained. Uh, the higher rated monosomous relatives are supposed to be better candidates to represent the sense of the target word. So their contexts are best suited as training examples in the word sense disambiguation task. Um, so once we have selected the monosomous candidate, candidates we can extract from the corpus uh, the context in which they occur. Then we substitute the monosomous relatives with the target ambiguous words in this text and add them to the training collection. Uh, we used uh, two described opera uh, for compiling such collections, uh, the use corpus and prosaru corpus. In our research, we implemented two ways of creating training collections based on the monosomous relatives rating. We compiled uh, the first collection only with the monosomous relatives from the top of the candidate rating. We wanted to obtain uh, 1000 examples for each of the target words. So for the simplicity, we will call this collection Corpus 1000 because we obtained exactly 1000 examples for each sense. I suppose the second um, methods uh, the training examples for the target ambiguous words were collected with the help of all respective uh, monosomous relatives with non-zero weight. The number of extracted contacts for a monosomous candidate is in direct proportion to its weight. And accordingly, we named this collection a balanced one because we used all the respective monosomous relatives. Uh, we conducted several experiments to determine uh, whether our text collection can be used as a training data set for a Watson's disambiguation model. In our research, we used a uh, nearest neighbor classification algorithm based on contextualized word embeddings ELMO and BIRD. In our experiments, we exploited two distinct ELMO models. Uh, the one trained uh, by Deep Pavlov on Russian WMT news, and uh, the other is a Rus Victoris lemmatized ELMO model trained on Taiga corpus. From the first model, we extracted a vector for a whole sentence with a target word, and uh, for the second one, we extracted a single vector for a target ambiguous word. We also used two BERT models. Uh, the one is BERT multilingual by Google Research, and the other is Rubert by Di Pablo. It was portrayed uh, especially for Russian language. To extract BERT contextualized uh, representation, we concatenated the representations from the top four hidden layers. Uh, next in these uh, tables, um, we demonstrate the results uh, obtained by different types of contextualized word embeddings, uh, different training collections, and uh, model parameters. Uh, we can see that uh, all systems um, pass the quality level of the baseline solution trained on the data set of the dictionary definitions and usage examples. Uh, the algorithm 
based on Elmo pre-trained embeddings by Rus Victoris, outperformed all other models, and the best result is a 0 0.857 F1 square. Uh, the second model in um, all the collections is Rubert by Di Pablo, followed by Elmo model by Di Pablo, and um, the lowest F1 score belongs to multilingual method. So, as for the differences between uh, the Corpus 1000 and the balanced collection, uh, we can observe uh, the minor performance drop for the Corpus uh, 1000 for all the models um, except for the Rubik. We can see that uh, Corpus 1000 doesn't include all the possible Manosian structures, so it lacks uh, contextual diversity. Uh, the balanced collection, on the contrary, is more representative with regard to the variety of the context. So, um, now for our additional findings, we can see that Prozaru uh, achieves better results and outcomes than use in the collection. Uh, the model trained on the news collection achieved lower F1 score because um, because of the lexical and structural differences between um, training and test sets. Uh, we know that the examples in the test set are um, uh, taken from Russian National Opus and Wikipedia. But uh, training uh, collection were composed of the news articles. On the contrary, Prozoru um, consists of various works of fiction. So, um, uh, the uh, Prozaru uh, training collection has more similar word representations to the test ones. And thus we conclude that um, similar genres of training and test collections give higher results in the word sense disintegration task. So, um, uh, on the slide, we briefly overview the results that I have already uh, demonstrated. And now to the conclusion. Uh, the issue that we addressed uh, in this article is the lack of defense annotated data for the Russian language. In this report, we have described our algorithm of automatic collection and annotation of training data for the Russian language. The main contribution of our research is that we have considered in selection and ranking algorithms a wide range of monosonous relative types. We also utilized the metric based on a assigned similarity to uh, determine the most appropriate monosonous relative to be added to the training collection. Uh, also, in order to uh, evaluate the training collections. We applied Kanye Restable classifier to the contextualized word embeddings and measured um, its performance on the Russia RuotNet test dataset. Uh, the best result was obtained with uh, Rusvictoras Elma model and Prozaru training collection and amounted to 0 0.857 F1 score. And we have also found that uh, the better performance of the uh, word sense disambiguation models is achieved when the genre of the training and test collections match. So um, that's all for now. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we will be glad to answer your questions. I found you. Neyi aynı sorun mu? Hayır Bey yenilerini yapıyorlar ya. Tabii ki. Hayır evet bugün bir buçuk kadar mı ne? Ar arayacaktım şimdi de ufak bir işim çıktı onu halledeyim öyle yapacağım. <gülüyor> şey yapalım şimdi bakalım başta tamam tamam
Hadi bakalım görüşürüz. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, and uh, I, I will ask you to be careful with your microphone uh, while um, a speaker is talking because it's not uh, pleasant when we hear anything around you. So be careful with your microphone. And it's time for questions now. You can ask here or you can. I write them in the chat as in the previous session. The nice organization Irina made um, was very comfortable for all of us, so we can keep it and write the questions in the chat and ask here, of course. Uh, we have one question in the chat here from Petya Ovsinova. Um, how much time did the best model take to train? Um, so it depends on the um, um, the number of the training uh, samples, and in our case, it took about uh, two hours to extract all the uh, vectors. Uh, for the target words and uh, then the inference is um, quite fast it takes around 10 minutes i guess yes i thank you very much for your interesting research my question is uh, do you consider Using knowledge bases, for example, on projects, in order to broaden the scope of uh, monosemantic relatives. Uh, so for now, we use only uh, Russian thesaurus, uh, RuWordNet. Um, I don't think that um, in uh, any. Uh, future search we will use uh, any other resources but uh, maybe it would be um, a good addition to our method thank you but for now we're only working with uh, the russian thesaurus thank you uh, another question from the Vettel Clover, thank you for the interesting talk. Do you distinguish harmony and polysemy? Uh, well, I can't hear you well. Uh, once again, please. Uh, the question is, do you distinguish homonymy and polysemy? Um, well, in our uh, research, we uh, do not have any uh, homonyms. We used only uh, listeners words. Well, I guess uh, the one or word can be a, a homonym. It's uh, the word uh, zamok um, in the mean castle and the lock. But all the other words are polysemous. Any other questions? So, there is no other question. I don't see any brain something. So we thank to uh, Angelina for her talk. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we uh, here. <laughs> um, so we we'll continue with the next talk. Thank you very much. The next talk.
East uh, Svetliza and Lesiapa on the Games of Yanova, who will present a consistent evaluation towards enhancing the conceptual representation of verbs and words. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yes, we hear you. Do you do you see my screen? Okay. Yes, you have to work. Thank you. Just before you start, I will ask again. Please be sure you are muting your microphones because we hear everything around. Okay. So so our talk uh, today is a uh, joint work with Svetlozara Leseva presenting the consistency evaluation procedures to enhancing the uh, concept representation of verbs in WordNet. So what I'll cover is some introductory words and then uh, I'll outline our work on mapping WordNet to FrameNet. Um, then I'll go to consistency presentation procedures, uh, some discussion on evaluation, and then we'll conclude with some remarks. Um, so, um, our long-term objective is to provide conceptual description of verbs uh, in WordNet by mapping WordNet to FrameNet and also some additional resources like VerbNet, uh, which we, at the moment, we don't fully use, but we intend to include more information from there. We also would like to ensure that the description is consistent and unified because what we get, we get existing mappings and other resources from different sources and we would like to uh, compile them into a unified and consistent system for, uh, des for describing conceptual information um, of verbs. And also what we would like to confirm that uh, is the validity of conceptual description across languages. So that when we use information provided for one language, we need to make sure that it is valid for Bulgarian in particular as well. So our resources, the two resources that we use in this study are WordNet, which is, as we know, a large lexical database that represents uh, conceptual and lexical knowledge in the form of a network of syn sets, uh, which are interconnected through a number of conceptual, semantic and lexical relations. And the second resource is FrameNet, which is a network representing lexical and conceptual knowledge of frame semantics. Uh, frames are basically conceptual structures describing particular types of objects, situa situations or events along with their uh, components called frame elements. And in particular, we are focused on the core frame elements within the frame. So um, just uh, to say that we are using both uh, Princeton WordNet and um, the Bulgarian WordNet, BullNet, which you can uh, find um, following these links. And um, also, we basically use this visualization of BullNet compared to um, aligned with um, Princeton WordNet. And also, um, we use uh, FrameNet. Uh, so, from the description of the frames in FrameNet, what we use is the definition of the frame, the core frame elements, as I uh, mentioned. We also use frame-to-frame uh, -frame relations. And uh, we also, as lexical information, we use the lexical units that are listed in each of the frames. So, basically, at the moment, we're focused on verbs. But in some frames, um, there are some frames which are um, mainly for nouns or adjectives. No problem. But we are, we are not taking these into account at the moment. 
So how are we mapping WordNet to FrameNet? So we, what we start with is a, um, a, a list of various sets of mappings, uh, which have been provided in, in, by various people, various teams working on that, on that task. Um, so here you can see some of those um, listed here. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So, um, but the problem with these existing uh, mappings is that uh, they provide limited coverage. So only about 30% of synsets in WordNet are matched with a frame from frame, frame net. So that's about 4,000 out of the 14,000 verb synsets. And also what we discovered in our observations um, was that not in all case, not in all cases they are reliable. So what we needed to do is basically perform some consistency checks some in, on the initial mappings that we got. Uh, most of all, we focused on those that have different mappings coming from different resources assigned to the same same set. Um, that, that were contradicting. And basically some of these existing mappings, they've been um, compiled automatically. So it is expected that there are some things in them that need to be validated. And the reason for these preliminary consistency checks was that uh, we start with good quality data, with reliable data because of the procedures that we apply later on. And these are procedures that are aimed at expanding the coverage. And basically, if we start with something that has errors in it, these errors will, will propagate um, onto the data and then uh, our mappings won't be very reliable. And after we apply the procedures that I'll uh, talk about in a bit, um, we finally implement further consistency checks um, and evaluation, and also uh, followed by the need of manual validation if we want um, these to be um, to be reliable. So what we are trying to do, basically, we start with FrameNet and WordNet, and what we are trying to do is to find an alignment so that to every scene set in WordNet, we assign a frame from FrameNet. And not only that, but we would like this frame to be um, as, as precise as possible so that it's, it corresponds to the level of abstraction of the word in um, in WordNet. So if we start with the scene set change, uh, and we, we're trying to um, find a frame for it, uh, we find that in one of the existing mappings, the mappings there is a map from um, in which uh, to the scene set change, uh, change is assigned the frame calls change. So starting from there, what we examine is the relations of that frame on one side, false change, and on the other side, we examine the relations within WordNet between the synset change and other synsets. And what we discover is there is a correspondence in inheritance relations. So um, we discover that the relation of um, of inheritance in frame that is, is inherited by. And there is another inheritance relation in WordNet, which is the oh, hyponym to hyponym relation. Then what we can do, uh, we assume um, that basically the, the conceptual description of the verb um, is actually transferred from the, the hypernym to the hypernym. So in this in this um, case, we get the frame of change and transfer it onto um, the scene set stiffen. Stiffen makes stiffer or stiffer. Uh, and then after that, we are trying to see, to check 
whether this is the this is as precise as possible or we could do better than that. So we examine the inheritance within FrameNet and based on that we can suggest the frame cost change of consistency which is actually uh, in inherited um, from uh, cost change. And then we examine other relations as well, like uh, like the relation is causative or causes in, in WordNet, uh, on the basis of which we can also do the same. So basically assign frames from FrameNet onto WordNet since it's based on these relations. So as I explained, we explore the relational structure of both resources, particularly that of WordNet, and uh, map frames to synsets on the basis of the inheritance of conceptual features in hypernym trees. So by assigning frames from the hypernym onto the hypernyms. We rely on the assumption that hypernyms either inherit the frame of their frame or have a more specific uh, frame, so have more specific semantics. So we need to narrow um, the frame, basically. Um, so as I said, the inherit we use the inheritance relations uh, in WordNet, but also in FrameNet, where the main inheritance relation is inherits from. Uh, so for example, the frame motion directional inherits from the frame motion. However, we, we extend the notion of inheritance within FrameNet also to include some the so-called weak in inheritance with relations such as uses. Um, for example, the frame body movement uses the frame motion. Um, and also another relation, subframe of. So uh, for example, the frame hold is a subframe of motion. So we basically in FrameNet we consider strong and proper inheritance and weak inheritance as well. So what we do is we basically identify a synset that does not have a frame assigned yet, or its frame is assigned but is not validated. Uh, it inherits a frame from its its uh, hypernym. Uh, it can be done in one, two, or even more steps if um, the the in intermediate uh, uh, nodes in in the um, in the WordNet tree have not been assigned a frame net either a frame uh, from frame net either. We then try to validate the frame or find a better fitting one, a more precise one. Uh, procedures that are outlined below check consistency of frame assignments and um, make a list of um, make a list of suggestions. And if we cannot find a better frame, a better fitting frame for the synset, then um, um, or there is some inconsistency in one of the resources or both, then sometimes we can propose additional um, additions to the resources or changes. Like for example, um, what we discovered, for example, in, in WordNet, um, there are some senses that combine both the causative and the non-causative meaning, like for example, the sense blacken, which can mean either make uh, yeah. black or become black. Um, but in this case, they basically need to be assigned different frames. So this is basically two different synsets that need to be placed in different places, in different um, uh, trees within uh, WordNet and require uh, two different frames. So one need to be positive and the other uh, no, so uh, things like that. Uh, in in cases like that, we can propose a change that uh, applies to either of the resources. Um, so our consistency procedures. Um, what we decided to do is um, to outline the main procedures, but to illustrate them with uh, some examples, so that. Um, they become clearer what we are trying to achieve. Uh, on the other hand, if 
you want to get into the technical details of what we're doing, um, you can see the paper. Um, the proceedings have already been published on the website. Um, so uh, basically the presentation will be mostly based on examples. So our consistency procedures, uh, we cover some, we use some procedures based on lexical and semantic analysis. Uh, also procedures ba based on semantic similarity. Some ranking procedures, when we get um, a list of suggestions, uh, how we rank them so that we can basically see which ones fit in better. Uh, also, our thoughts on proposing new frames, uh, adding to the frame net resource so that it covers uh, WordNet as much as possible, and also some words on manual uh, validation that is required after that if we decide to get a reliable resource that is not entirely automatic, not entirely based on um, automatic procedures. So the first one, the first type of procedures is the lexical and semantic analysis. And the first procedure is to check whether, to use uh, basically lexical information and to check whether any of the literals in the scene set appear as lexical units in FrameNet, in, in the frame of within FrameNet. So we first consider the frame that is assigned from the hyponym to confirm whether it's valid. And if any of the literals in the scene set appear as uh, lexical units in this frame, it is very likely that it is, um, it is valid. Like for example, with the scene set flutter, uh, we find it as a uh, lexical unit in frame in body movement. So that's how we confirm that body movement is a very good candidate, is a very good match. The second one is also to check if the literals appear as lexical units, but we extend to cover more specific frames of the frame that is being assigned so that we are trying to find a better fit. Uh, by more specific, what we mean is uh, related through a inheritance relation, either direct inheritance, uh, strong inheritance, or weak inheritance. So we extend uh, the coverage of inheritance here. Um, and in this way, uh, what we find, for example, the the, the verb strengthen was assigned the frame called change, which is very, very general. Um, which is very general, the frame called change. So we are trying to make it more specific to fit the meaning of the verb. And um, what we discover is that the verb strengthen appears as a lexical unit in a um, in the frame called change of strength, which is actually uh, which inherits from cause change. So it's a child of cause change, and then we match it to the to the to the synset. So the third one, which is also to check whether the literals appear in, in as a lexical units, but here we extend to sister frames of the assigned frame. So that we say that it's maybe, um, it is at the right level of obstruction, but maybe it is related. Um, it is like, um, Relate it is at the same level of abstraction, but actually is not directly um, related. I mean, it doesn't. It's not an inherited frame, but it is maybe related in in another sort of of relation. And here, for example, if we see um, the verb educate, teach or refine to be discriminative in taste or judgment. Uh, it's been assigned the, the, from the hyponym, it's been assigned the frame calls to make progress. But what we discover, uh, we discover a better fit 
we discover the frame education teaching, which is a sister frame of calls to make progress. So in this case, um, it is not a more specific frame, but it is a frame that is in a different relation with um, the frame that's been assigned. And in that frame education teaching, we can see the lexical units educate, a school train, which is a clear indication that probably education teaching is a better match for this sunset. Um, so that's using the um, relations, the inheritance relations within WordNet. So what we uh, saw was relations not within uh, WordNet, but uh, relations, inheritance relations within FrameNet. So we take the same set literals, we compare them, we look for lexical units of frames that is either the frame that's been assigned or frames that are its children or frames that are its sisters. Now what we are trying to do is um, consider the same operation, but now we don't consider relations between frames, we consider relations between synset. So what we get in this second type of test, second uh, set of procedures, is we check whether any of the synset literals appear as lexical units in um, the frames that's been assigned to its hyponyms or, or is the frames that's been assigned to its sisters. So in this uh, sort of um, in this sort of procedure, we uh, take, for example, the verb regenerate. It's been assigned the frame calls to make progress, but we see that in some uh, some of his um, hyponyms have been assigned the frame rejuvenation, and in it we can see the second literal appearing as a lexical unit revitalize. So in this case, uh, we give it as a suggestion that rejuvenation might be a better fit for um, this sunset. And as I mentioned, we also consider the current sunset. We consider its sisters as well, and we see all the frames that's been assigned to its sisters so that we see whether any of those might fit better. Uh, for example, if we take the synset nurse, try to cure by special care or of treatment, um, and it's been assigned a frame from an existing mapping, which is medical professionals, uh, which is one of those that, that are not very reliable in this case, um, because it's mixed up with the noun nurse. Um, so in this case, uh, what we see we consider all the, the sisters of the verb nurse and then we discover in their frames and we discover that in the frame cure we've got the lexical unit nurse and that's why we consider this to be a better match. So also we extend the, the tests um, we extend not only to cover frames that are being assigned to hyponyms or to sister sets, but we also discover, we also are looking for frames that are related to those frames. So re related in the meaning that either are inherited or inherit from or uh, sister frames of any of those frames that are in, in the previous two procedures. So, for example, in remonstrate, what we are seeing here is being assigned the frame from the hyponym, it's being assigned the frame telling. And we look for all the frames, that, uh, for all the frames of the hyponyms, for all the frames of the sisters, and we take the relations um, of the, all the relations of these frames, and we discover the frame judgment communication. And in this case, telling and judgment communication are both related to an inheritance relation to statement. So they are both stepsisters. So that's how we, we get, get to this judgment communication in which lexical units we find remonstrate. And that's how we uh, suggest it. We give it as a suggestion for a better match. 
And the third time of lexical and semantic analysis procedure is to check whether any of the synset literals appear as lexical units in any other frame in WordNet. So um, we look for anything else in WordNet frames that have not been related between each other. And as you can imagine in this sort of procedure, we get a lot of suggestions and not all of them are um, relevant what we are looking for. For example, the sense that abandon, uh, give up with the intent of never claiming again, which is a root synset, so it doesn't have any, it doesn't have a hypernym, so we can't match it from, from there. Uh, uh, in, in these cases in particular, this is a very useful procedure because it is, uh, it, it at least gives an idea what, where we can check for the frame of this verb. Even if it's not very precise suggestion, even if it's not um, the right one, it at least gives an idea where we might be looking for the, the frame. Um, and in these cases, you can see some suggestions, uh, and some of them are not um, very relevant. So another procedure is um, the use of keywords. Uh, we check for words that are contained in the frame name itself or their derivatives, or we identify um, synsets with um, literals and definitions containing these keywords. So um, you can see some of the examples. Similarity-based procedures, uh, what we uh, test here is uh, direct similarity between the verb clause and the definitions of, of lexical units in, in FrameNet. What we are looking for here is um, actually match between um, verbs and nouns and other verbs within the same with uh, within the definitions. In which case, for example, with Beto, we actually get the suggestion that cause harm has a, a good similarity level measurement with the gloss of. Uh, Beto 3, so um, we confirm that this frame is maybe correct. Uh, but also we consider in, indirect similarity between glosses of synthesis, which are derivatively related to the verb and the clauses of their hypernyms and so on, uh, in which case we can also get some informative suggestions. Um, then what we're trying to do is provide a ranking of all the suggestions. We order them by the score. There's some information about how we get the score in the paper. Um, and sometimes even if we get like a higher rated uh, suggestion, uh, we basically here we can see that motion noise is suggested by three different procedures. So it's um, we need to figure out a combined score for each frame as well. And then, as I mentioned, we need uh, decisions uh, is made based on the manual inspection of the frame definition and frame elements. And we are still in the process of uh, improving the automatic uh, procedure so that they are uh, more reliable and they give more reliable um, uh, suggestion so that it uh, minimizes the manual work, but we are not at, at this um, stage yet. We are still um, working continuously on it. Uh, so as our evaluation shows here, um, we are still, I mean, we still have um, relatively low precision of the procedures of each procedure independently. But also we calculate relevance uh, so that the suggestion is not only um, evaluated as right or wrong, but how informative, how much information it gives, where we can look uh, for the correct frame. Not, even if it's not precise, 
it uh, can uh, help us by saying, okay, it's somewhere here in FrameNet. So you get like a, a set of frames that you can check and, and find the, the answer there. So as I said, we need more work um, to minimize manual work, especially to outline new procedures to analyze further the semantic relations and to expand to other semantic relations as well. And it's been part of um, our work is part of um, this project was a semantic network enriched with a variety of semantic relations. Thank you. Thanks to our speaker. Uh, it's time for questions now. We have some uh, problem with uh, a previous one uh, who was uh, in, the pro uh, in the streaming and uh, maybe he switched off, but his audio left and he went. So sorry for the noise, but the technical. Is working on this. I hope we'll, in the next talk we will cope with something similar. Any questions in the chat? So, for the moment, Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have a question. Uh, do you use manual or automatic uh, in order to perform mappings between frames and synsets? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I, I didn't hear all of it. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. And uh, the question is, um, do you use manual or automatic analysis uh, in order to perform mappings uh, from frames? To that? Uh, so the procedures that I explained, they're all automatic. But at the end of the procedures, what we get is a list of suggested frames. So in some cases, if, I mean, there might be a uh, like a, a frame is suggested by many procedures and then we confirm that it is the correct one but in many cases uh, it is not as clear so in many cases different frames have been suggested and we need to what we are trying to figure out is to make like to, to score to make a score that shows which is the most reliable one so that we, we select it automatically, but um, it is very difficult. So at, at the moment, what we do is we use the procedures, we get all these suggestions, and we manually choose uh, which one is um, the valid one. So we combine automatic with um, manual work. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I can see that there is an uh, question. Um, thank you. Uh, how do you decide how many levels of inheritance are sufficient? I assume the levels are different for different sin sets. Um, Yes, so uh, if, well, first of all, uh, especially with regards to frames within FrameNet, in some cases we discover that um, the inheritance there is not fully implemented. So, for example, um, what we saw is that, um, for example, all these, there are a lot of calls change subframe of uh, frames that are inherited, that basically inherit from cause change, but are not related to it directly. So we introduce this um, additional relations, we add up to FrameNet, 
and all of these cause change cause change of strength cause change of consistency cause change of this and that we add them as inheriting from cause change which helps us by adding these relations it helps us to expand easier to we get a, a various a different level of inheritance within okay. training. Okay. And okay. in okay. WordNet okay. then it becomes a little okay. bit easier because okay. we can okay. match okay. this inheritance with WordNet. But especially when we, uh, for example, if the root of the tree doesn't have any frame assigned, then we can't go deeper and deeper. Or if it's God, but then we inherit on the first step some some if we go the frame then it, it's inherited by the hipponyms then by their hipponyms and so on and so on and it's become becomes less and less reliable if it's inherited in many steps so what we're trying to do is basically we're trying to confirm uh the key places where there are like a lot of three going on down uh, we need to confirm manually this frame so that we at least know that they are, the, the hyponyms of this synset are reliably matched with the frame and so on. So it's, um, I don't know if that was precisely the question. But, uh, thank you. Well, Another awesome. question uh, before we restart this system because uh, we can't, can't avoid uh, another way this noise. Uh, from YouTube channel, from Rosita, I don't know for a minute I had to um, miss what you said, so if you answered, sorry. Have you tried to narrow the suggested frames by part of speech uh, to avoid frames for nouns, suggested verbs, for example? um uh yes i mean if we only consider frames that have already been assigned to verbs so that we know uh like in each frame there's like lexical units listed and, uh, we only take those that have at least one verb uh, in them so that we narrow down a little bit uh, but so, in some cases we might miss a frame, so it's never, yeah, it's never as clear um, with the narrowing. But yes, we we were trying to do that as well. Another question. Okay, let's thanks to say thanks to our speaker. And, uh, and I will ask you to um, go out of the system and wait uh, five minutes and enter an, uh, a new link will be sent for everyone. Enter uh, in the system from your email because uh, we can can't cope with this technical problem another way. So you have a new invitation in your emails. Uh, just enter again. <laughs>
few minutes more before the next speaker. Maybe a few minutes more because Svetlana can't uh, connect again. Five minutes more, maybe.
Yes. Uh, so this is our next speaker, Svetlana Jetrova from the Institute for Bulgarian Language. And so the topic of her talk is on word net semantic classes. Is the sum always bigger? So uh, just a second. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Hello? No, we don't. Not yet. Okay. No. Now? Now it's on. Okay. So, um, the work that I will just do to check how to okay uh the work that i will present uh, 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 uh expand window to fit just a second because it's yeah um that i will uh present you uh is uh, actually a discussion on the results of an effort uh, on the expansion of the WordNet noun semantic classes by enriching them with the semantic types uh, which uh, are part of uh, the so-called corpor corpus pattern analysis ontology, uh, which uh, is employed by uh, the framework of the pattern dictionary of uh, English verbs, uh, which, um, which um, actually describe uh presents conceptual frames uh, on uh, information uh, which is based on uh, data from corpora uh, i will um show you um i will present you first with the matching uh, the matching work and then i will uh, present you a case study on a set of uh, semant of, of, of nouns of a certain semantic class uh, which have been assigned the semantic types of the CPA ontology and then I will discuss some steps for validation of the results. On this slide uh, you can see the 26 semantic classes which uh, each have been assigned to the nouns in WordNet. Uh, so uh, the nouns denoting humans are assigned uh, the, sem the semantic class of noun person. Uh, plants are noun plants. Uh, foods and drinks are noun uh, food. Uh, here uh, you have um, the organization of the nouns in the structure of WordNet. They are uh, structured in uh, so-called hypernym hyponym trees uh, and each formed um, certain hierarchies under the uh, under the uh, nouns which are assigned the semantic class of noun tops. These are the so-called uh, unique beginners. So the topmost synset is entity, which has three hyponyms, physical entity, abstract entity, and thing. Uh, and then physical entity and abstract entity are noun tops or unique beginners. Under physical entity, he have six hyponyms, and under abstract entity, he have seven hyponyms, and each of them um, starts begins uh, its own sub hierarchy of uh, nouns. So the causal agent uh, synset uh, is the topmost 
for the noun persons, for example, and some noun phenomena, noun state and noun object. Uh, the communication one is uh, the topmost, um, the topmost scene set for noun communications and uh, so on. Uh, so the 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 most important um, um, element of our work is uh, that along the hyponym hyponym tree, the nouns that are part of this tree inherit information from the other nouns, uh, and uh, especially from their hyponyms. So some entities may inherit information from different. Uh, from different sub hierarchies as they may have more than one hypernym. So substance one uh, has two hypernyms, matter one, which is noun substance, uh, and part 18, which is a noun relation, and the noun substance uh, is uh, related deep down to the noun top physical entity, while uh, the noun relation uh, is classified as abstract entity. Uh, a few words about the, the ontology of the corpus pattern analysis. Uh, it consists of uh, two, um, over uh, 250 semantic types, which reflects properties shared by nouns uh, in argument position of uh, a collection of uh, verbs. Uh, this information is based uh, on uh, the data from the from corpora for the English language. Uh, the ontology is uh, relatively shallow with the anything uh, semantic type on top. Uh, and here I, um, I have given the uh, six subtypes uh, of the anything, of five of the anything, and then the not connected uh, is uh, is uh, actually separate type. Uh, so uh, under the the type entity, we have abstract entity, energy, physical object, particle, self. Uh, the type eventuality uh, is uh, divided to uh, events and states and so on. So here we have also under the different types, um, uh, semantic types such as wine, water, food, beverage and so on. Uh, the mapping we have uh, matched um, uh, in in uh, in uh, five years work. Uh, the appropriate higher scene sets within the within the word net noun hierarchy based on uh, the uh, information about the the hitter. So the strategy, the strategy was uh, was as follows: If a scene set contains a literal to match the CPA semantic type, we uh, have checked the definition and the hyponyms, and we have chosen the highest and most popular scene set. So the the the, the scene set artifact one was matched to art to the, the semantic type of. Of, of artifact, the two scene sets foot one and foot three are matched to the, the semantic type of foot, uh, and so on. Uh, so the the topmost uh, semantic types was uh, are matched manually by two annotators, and a third annotator uh, had to resolve the conflicts, uh, and then um, by um, by inheritance, uh, these semantic types was automatically um, automatically generated populated actually uh, along the uh, hypernym hypernym tree. Uh, thus, uh, the, the semantic types for the nouns have been applied to the entire 
or net data. And they have been added to uh, the semantic class. Uh, here is an example about, uh, of the Sinset New York State Barge Canal, which is a known location. And uh, uh, three, uh, three CPA semantic types have been applied to it, artifact, water course, and hot or okay. And we, uh, from this, we can uh, actually um, uh, draw the information that uh, this noun location is actually a man-made um, element entity uh, for uh, transportation along the water. Uh, so I will present you uh, with uh, um, the results of, on uh, the nouns uh, which uh, have been applied um, the semantic type of food. These are foods and drinks. Uh, these are more than uh, two uh, two thousand and one hundred uh, synsets. Um, that there are uh, certain uh, noun foods, certain nouns uh, classified as noun foods, which uh, have been not applied the semantic type of noun food. You, you'll see which uh, are they further. Uh, here is uh, the, the, um, the data of, uh, of the assignment. Um, most of them, uh, the most populous two, two subgroups uh, are stuffs and solid foods. Uh, and we have also a big, a big subgroup of, um, of um, natural objects, let's say, and uh, the drinks, and the alcoholic drink and average. Uh, what uh, are the observations? The least populous, uh, the least populous subgroups um, involve uh, synsets of semantic class that are different from noun food. Uh, this, uh, the the food semantic type uh, was assigned because uh, it was inherited from a hypernym, actually somewhere down the. the, 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 the so these are what we have noun, um, noun groups, noun substances, uh, and uh, I think and noun body. The three synsets are noun body. Uh, we have uh, two uh, quite strange, let's say, old semantic types: abstract entity and the natural, natural landscape feature. Uh, the abstract entity semantic type uh, has. Uh, can be deemed admissible, for example, with uh, the so-called concept of power breakfast and elixir and elixir of life, but uh, certainly not with milk. Uh, and the natural landscape feature semantic type uh, was applied to a scene sets that referred to natural objects mostly, and th this is admissible with roots, but certainly not with vitamin peel. Another, uh, another observation is um, this, um, uh, as you, uh, as we know, Hernet is heavily anthropocentric, so uh, we have two uh, synsets uh, which refers to milk. One of these uh, is uh, uh, considered the stuff, uh, which is uh, the liquid which is produced by mammary glands, the female mammals for feeding their young, uh, while milk five uh, is uh, uh, while milk five. Uh, has been assigned the semantic type of average because it is the uh, the his white nutritious liquid that uh, uh, is used uh, as food by human beings. Uh, as I uh, said, um, fruits. Uh, this is uh, an interesting thing. Is that um, is the natural landscape feature semantic type. 
uh, and here uh, fruits are uh, are classified are um, structured or located under the uh, under the synset edible fruit, which is noun food, and uh, it has two hypernyms. Uh, one is green goods uh, produce, which is noun food, but the other uh, is uh, fruit five, which is uh, the, the, which is classified as and noun plant, and from here, uh, these semantic types of the natural landscape feature and three part uh, has been inherited actually. The drinks uh, are uh, classified as abstract entities, uh, and this is uh, somehow uh, understandable because most of uh, them, uh, most of alcoholic drinks and beverages are actually man-made products. Uh, but um, as uh, here uh, we have uh, um, a, an example about the water. Uh, actually, the sparkling water is classified uh, as food, uh, while the tap water uh, was assigned the semantic type of material, but uh, not food. Uh, and a few words about this power breakfast. Uh, it is uh, a concept which refers to an, a meeting of influential people to conduct business while eating breakfast. Uh, and it has two hypernyms. Uh, one is human group abstract entity and the other uh, is breakfast tree, which is classified as noun food. Uh, while uh, in uh, the data that there's another scene set, dinner or dinner party, a party of people assembled to have the dinner together, which is uh, basically uh, in the same context. However, uh, it has only one hypernym. Uh, it is uh, it it is a noun group and it has been assigned only the human group and abstract entity uh, semantic types. Uh, what, uh, sh what uh, shall we uh, look for uh, in the data? First, we have to check whether the word net semantic class is compatible with the assigned CPA semantic type. Uh, because it is not always the case with this, it is true. While as you, uh, as we um, we uh, have seen uh, with the power breakfast and then onto onto uh, some type of acid, I think wasn't uh, it wasn't particularly. Uh, appropriate. Uh, we have to check, of course, whether there are literals in the scene set that are compatible uh, with the assigned semantic type, but this is to be expected from the procedure itself. Uh, we have to check uh, also the, the inheritance along the hyponym hyponym tree and how deep down uh, the tree um, one, uh, one uh, odd semantic type. Um, Cause. Uh, so for the mother's milk, uh, the abstract entity is actually uh, um, inherited from uh, the hyper, the second hypernym of a hypernym very deep down the tree, which is uh, again a uh, part eighteen and noun relation. While most of the most of the Mm, uh, 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 of the nouns along the hypernym hypernym tree uh, are actually uh, somehow related to the noun top of physical entity. Uh, so, uh, as I uh, told you, we have other types of foods that were not classified with the food semantic type, but that uh, but they uh, have been classified with types which refers to their source, like meat, uh, or the fact that they're part of some other entity, like quantity. So, uh, the, the, these are more than three uh, hundred noun insects. These are mainly 
uh, of course, uh, nouns that refer to feed, but nouns that refer to uh, foods that are part of an animal or part of uh, a portion of meat or a cut of meat. Uh, so here, the first, uh, the first, uh, the first assumption that uh, he have to check also the, the semantic class and assigning is valid. And what is the, the conclusion? Uh, is the sum always bigger? It's not always because actually the uh, the information about uh, these concepts and this is to be uh, expected from the procedure itself, this information is uh, actually uh, somehow um, available uh, in the structure of the WordNet uh, itself. Uh, so it's just an explicit, an explicit uh, show of the of this information here. So the work is funded under a project which was financed by the Bulgarian National Science Fund, Fund and I will, I want to thank them and thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interesting talk, and now it's time for questions. You can write them in the chat of uh, mm. either or in the channel. For the presentation, wow. I have a question. Uh -huh. And the question is uh, Do you assemble an ontology uh, for your semantic types, or do you use uh, some existing upper ontology such as Wikipedia or Dolce? No, we have used an ontology which was constructed. Uh, for uh, for uh, saturating uh, the uh, requirements of frames of certain English verbs, and it is called uh, the Pattern Dictionary of English Verbs, and uh, it consists of frames, uh, and uh, on each position uh, of the arguments of these verbs, uh, the there is um, the there is uh, uh, assigned uh, the, the nature of the noun. So this is uh, information that uh, has been uh, elected, has been collected um, from the... This, uh, this source. So the two, the the CPA ontology and the WordNet uh, semantic classes uh, have been uh, matched. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, have you, on the basis of the observation in the WordNet hierarchy, obtained further levels of refinement of the corpus pattern analysis? Uh, no, I haven't. I, I can't. Yeah, I, I can't. Um, I can't say for, for now. Any other questions? I don't see any questions in the YouTube channel also. Maybe you're tired from <laughs> so we have another question. Uh -huh. Do you consider some of the cases as regular polysemy? Oh, uh, I wouldn't say that it is poly polysemy. Like breakfast? Uh, chicken, chicken, what do you mean? Chicken as a food and chicken as meat. 
animal meat of animal. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if we have no other questions, uh, we can uh, finish uh, today's uh, session and the conference. Uh, and uh, I will give the words to thank you, everyone, for the patience. So when we had the technical problems and from the for the interesting talks, and I'll give the work to the work to Professor Farva to close uh, the conference. Uh, Здравейте. Hi. In English, um, I um, I will just uh, conclude uh, the conference uh, because Professor Kov experiences um, some problems with the microphone, so we um, negotiated on that. Um, uh, so I would like uh, then to thank um, um, from uh, my name and also her name for the nice uh, conference. Um, I have to say that uh, it was the uh, first um, uh, collaborative conference between the two institutions, Institute of Bulgarian Language, that uh, already had a big experience with this uh, nice conference, and the Institute of Information and Communication Technologies. And I think that uh, during this uh, coronavirus period, it was really like a ray of sun. And I hope it was um, for everyone involved. Like, um, we would like to thank the um, uh, reviewers, the authors, the supporters, and uh, every, everybody that was involved. And also, last but not least, uh, the organizing teams from both institutions. You were great, and you really did uh, great work. And I think it was worth it. Um, there were uh, great papers, great discussions, and great proceedings, uh, which is uh, already online. Uh, so um, I would like to say stay safe and uh, just uh, we hope to meet together on other nice events that will come up. And um, yeah, enjoy your weekend with these nice memories. Thank you.